Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to lecture 31 of SBR, IFRS 9, which is financial instrument. This is the main standard on financial instruments, which is going to deal with all the other related issues. Before this, I have covered IS 32, which is financial instruments presentation, where we talked about definition of financial asset, financial liability, then compound instrument. Then we went through IFRS 7 which is on the disclosure, financial instruments disclosure. Now we are moving on to the measurement, recognition, subsequent recognition, and all the other things like derivatives, embedded derivatives, hedge accounting, impairment of financial asset. We are going to cover all this. This is going to be a very lengthy lecture, okay? because this has so many parts to it okay it's very complex and it's complex in a sense of you have to remember a lot of things a lot of thinking is required here to connect the dots because so much of things are there to remember but don't worry it is not going to be so difficult if you keep on doing questions on ifrs 9 it's going to be one of the easiest standard but in your sbr okay the important thing is the good thing in fact is ifrs 9 is not tested so much Usually it is tested for around, let's say, five to six marks. It's not tested very heavily, right? Compared to other standards like IS-16 or IS-38 or IS-36. IFRS 9 is not tested so much. And not all the areas of IFRS 9 are frequently tested. Some areas are there which comes frequently. Some, they have never been tested. Some, sometimes it comes, sometimes it does not come. So it has various patterns of coming right but be prepared for it okay so let's start okay we are going to do lots of questions there and this one and it has lots of things lot of contents are here compared to other standards this is going to be uh, the most biggest uh, standard so we are going through recognition and measurement of financial liabilities first we are going to finish finish off with the financial liabilities before we touch financial asset then is the financial asset then accounting for investments in equity instruments and debt instruments there are two types of instruments that you have to know equity and debt and the way they function are different financial assets okay impairment of financial assets like any other asset whether tangible intangible even financial assets have impairment okay derecognition of this financial instruments derivatives and embedded derivatives hedge accounting you see, there are so many parts to it. So when you're studying IFRS 9, you're not studying all of them together. You just don't keep reading, reading, reading. It does not help. You first have to master one topic before you go to the next. For example, if you're studying financial liability, just focus on financial liability and do all the questions. Once you're done with it, move to financial asset, then equity instruments, then debt instruments, then derivatives, then hedge accounting, like that. Okay. And trust me, it, is not at all very difficult looks like very complex looks like very challenging from the beginning don't keep this thought in your head that this is going to be something very difficult Oof, too much i can't handle if you keep if you go and study ifrs 9 with that mindset you will never ever remember anything nor you will enjoy it because it is a very technical area the standard and lots of things to remember you need to keep your mind calm and very focused okay you might even need one uh, two to three days to cover this standard this one standard alone okay now recognition and measurement of financial liabilities okay initially you recognize it at fair value this is very easy because most of the standards if you see everything they say whether it is deferred tax or they always say measure it at fair value okay most of the standards in fact so Initially, financial liabilities are measured at fair value, okay? If the financial liability will be held at fair value through profit and loss, then the transaction cost will be expensed in the statement of profit and loss. If the financial liability will not be held at fair value through profit and loss, the transaction costs are deducted from the carrying amount of the financial liability. You need to remember this thing. In the beginning, if you're not understanding, don't worry. As soon as we do a question, what you have to do is come back again to this slide okay 
come back again to this part and then read it reread it you will be able to understand the whole picture better once we do the calculation or with the number so that's how you have to do go back from the question come back again and revisit okay if you're not understanding in the first uh, first time okay because you have an option okay when it comes to financial liability or even financial asset there is an option family through profit and loss then you have a right to elect family through other components of income okay then we are going to the subsequent measurement initially it is at fair value there is no option but subsequent measurement of financial liability what is financial liability and all we have covered this in is 32 you have to go back and reverse it okay it is like any liability the only thing is it's financial it has to deal with cash it, it is financed like your debtors sorry creditors you you have an obligation to pay them it's a financial liability some liabilities are not financial they are non-financial liability So subsequent treatment could be option either at amortized cost or fair value through profit and loss. You see initially you recognize it at fair value but subsequent measurement gives you an option either at amortized cost or fair value through profit and loss. Okay and financial liabilities like borrowings. Why borrowing is a financial liability? Because you have an obligation to pay to the bank. Or from whomever you have borrowed you have an obligation so whenever there's an obligation to pay in cash or financial instruments it's a financial liability okay so borrowing is one example like loan bond debenture this are financial liability okay so borrowings like that are subsequently measured at amortized costs using the effective interest method what is this effective interest method is what we are going to discover now effective rate of interest okay now first assume that there's a loan okay company takes out a bank loan of 10 million for five years and interest is 10 percent so interest will be if you take 10 percent of 10 million which is 1 million and into five years because it's for five years this is the total interest okay now assume that the company issues a bond let's come to the bond this also has 10 million interest is 10 percent okay however the company issues the bond for only 9 million and has agreed to repay 12 million to the bondholders in five years time this also since it's 10 million and 10 percent interest will be 5 million over five years okay but on top of this there's an extra that you have to pay entity has to pay extra 3 million 12 minus 9 right it has received 9 repaying 12 so the difference that means they have to pay three more the difference right so if you add this five and three it's eight this is the total cost of the loan and this aid according to the accrual concept should be spread over the five year period this is achieved by charging interest on the liability using the effective rate of interest and the effective rate is the uh, internal rate of return on the investment it is the i r r in afm we have studied what is irr in detail right internal rate of return and even if you if you haven't taken afm but through your financial reporting you know what is irr it is the rate at which net present value is zero right Now we'll be moving on to calculating the amortized cost. Now let's move on to calculating this amortized cost. Okay. First, what do you do? The initial carrying amount of a financial liability is measured at amortized cost. Okay. Measured at amortized cost is its fair value less any transaction cost. Okay. That means the net proceeds from the issue. And then you charge an interest on that liability or for interest you can also say finance cost because interest goes as a finance cost right in your income statement you write interest in as a finance cost so that interest is charged on the liability using what 
using effective rate of interest this will increase your liability so it's like a loan think of a loan you have to pay the principal amount of the loan with that you have to pay the interest also on top of that is the same so when you're finding that interest on the liability how are you doing it using the effective rate of interest okay so this will be the double entry you debit the finance cost that is the interest that goes as an expense in pnl and you credit your liability because it will increase your liability then once you make the cash payment liabilities are reduced so your liability is debit and you credit your cash amortized cost table this is how an amortized cost table will look like okay you have an opening balance opening liability with that you add your finance cost this is how you add opening liability into the effective rate you have to take the effective rate okay add then any cash payment deduct that will be your closing liability then this closing liability becomes the opening liability for the next year so if it's given for two three years that's how you move it forward right then this becomes here the opening and on on that you charge finance costs again cash payment will be same fixed okay how do you get the cash payment on your nominal value that is given to you based on the coupon percentage you multiply okay so here the finance cost this one goes to profit and loss as an expense the cash payment will go to statement of cash flow and the closing liability will go in the statement of financial position okay now let us go through a question illustration one loan that is issued at a discount okay so the loan note was 50000 nominal value discount issued at a discount 16% the cost of issue was 2000 interest of 5% of the nominal value is payable annually in areas bond must be redeemed on 1st of jan 2006 that is 1 2 3 4 5 after 5 years at a premium of this much effective rate of interest is also given they will give you okay how will this be reported in the financial statement over the period to redemption that means over five years okay so here first you have to you have an option initially what you will recognize your liability at what tell me you will recognize your liability initially at what here is the area where you have to apply your initial measurement and subsequent measurement so let's do that initial measurement was at fair value if you remember it's a financial liability or you can say net proceeds that is received as net proceeds received okay now what is the face value it was for 50000 you have to deduct all your transaction cost okay remember if it is fair value through profit and loss you have to what the transaction cost and all will be deducted okay less 16 percent discount not the coupon rate you have to take the discount you have to take this discount always is like this discount or the premium of the coupon value you have to take whatever you're issuing at that you have to deduct so 16 percent of 50,000 is 8,000 and then issue cost you have to deduct which is 2,000 so it's 40,000 is the initial recognition of a liability now then you have a choice amortize or fair value through profit and loss so this is a loan we go by amortize cost okay this is how you show the amortize cost just now we went through that table up remember this table 
this is the table we have to follow over the years so here i will write five years year one two three four and five five okay now opening balance o b then we have the finance cost the interest then we have cash payment then we have the closing balance cb so first year you have to take this initially recognized one here 40 you always have to start like this once you do that okay effective interest rate you have to apply what is the effective interest rate is 12 percent this 12 percent you have to apply on the opening balance it's always like this it's fixed effective interest rate only so 12 percent 12 percent on 40,000 will be 4,800 you add because interest will further increase your liability then any cash payment you deduct what will be your cash payment see on that nominal value okay on that 50,000 not on this 40,000 on this 50,000 the discount so sorry it is this one interest of 5% of the nominal value is payable that is the cash that you are paying okay 5% so it's 2500 this remains 2500 for all the four years okay this is fixed if you keep on doing questions like this you will understand the nature okay so 40 plus 4800 minus 2500 you're going to get closing balances if you do your calculation correctly 42300 now this 42300 becomes the opening balance next year that's how you proceed so on this if you apply 12 percent which is effective interest rate does this minus 2500 44876 this becomes the opening balance on this you apply 12 percent then it is 5385 five. then you are getting 47761 then 47761 okay sorry it's not triple seven it's just two seven five seven three one then fifty nine nine two then fifty nine nine two six one one nine one see this a rounded figure okay if you add up the total this is 12,500. This is 27,111. Okay. This is the interest. This goes in PNL as an expense. This goes to cash flow. Statement of cash flow. This is cash. This, the closing balance will go to statement of financial position. Okay. Now to show this figure. Okay. You can show like this also. What is the repayment? I will show this through another figure another way okay what is the capital amount you are issuing it at premium capital amount was 50,000 okay premium was you see 4611 at a premium it must be redeemed so 4611 if you add up it's 54611 now interest add interest with it 50,000 into 5% into 5 years. It is, it is 12,500. This we already know. Add it. 67,111. Deduct your cash payment. That is 40,000. Okay, cash received. It is not this. You are deducting this 40,000. Then you are getting 27,111. This is your total finance cost or total cost for the loan. This one, 27,111. You are getting it this way also. Make sure that you know how to get it through both the ways. Now, one thing can you notice that the finance that is charged to PNL is greater than the cash payment. Okay. What does it mean? That means the value of the liability increases over the life of the instrument until it equates the re uh, redemption value at the end of its term. When it reaches the end of the term, before that, until it reaches the end of the term, before that, liability keeps on increasing. Okay. And if you check from year 1 to 4, 
the balance shown as a liability is less than the amount that will be payable on redemption. Therefore, the full amount payable must be disclosed in the notes of the financial statements. Okay. Let's check. Now let us do test understanding 2. Test your understanding too. So in this, you have three people raising finance in three separate ways, and you have to explain how under three separate uh, how these three separate financial instruments should be accounted. One is Ho, one is Wiggins, one is Cavendish. One by one will go. First, let us finish with Hoy. Okay. Hoy raised finance on 1st of Jan 2001 by the issue of two year 2% 2 bond with a nominal value of 10,000. So it's a two year 2% 2 bond with a nominal value of 10,000. This 2% is the coupon rate. It was issued at a discount of 5% and redeemable at a premium of this. Issue cost can be ignored. Bond has an effective rate of interest 10%. Don't get confused, okay? Coupon rate is something else. Effective rate of interest rate of interest is something else. And the discount is the transaction cost and all. Okay? Effective rate of interest is to find the finance cost. And the coupon rate is to find the cash payment. Okay, I will write it somewhere. Coupon rate gives you cash payment. Okay, then effective in rate of interest gives you the finance cost and the discount or premium are the transaction cost. Okay, remember this. So now that's why there are three separate discount the interest two two percent five percent and ten percent do not get confused with this three okay you will always get this in all the questions okay now please understand this is a bond okay bond is a kind of a borrowing so earlier we said that borrowing are measured at what subsequently they are measured at amortized cost okay remember that table of amortized in fact, all the borrowings are like that, whether it's a bond, whether it's a loan. Bond and loan usually are given a bond or a loan, either of this. And they are measured at amortized cost. Basically, you just have to follow the table. Okay. But before that, okay, all the transaction costs, see, you are measuring this at what? Amortized cost. Okay. So here, when you're doing it, okay, that means what? You're not measuring it fair value through profit and loss. If it was fair value through profit and loss, transaction costs are expensed. They go in the PNL. But if you are choosing, if you're not going through fair value through profit and loss, like in this case, you are going through amortized cost, then you have to deduct your transaction cost from the value of a financial liability. You understanding? It's always like this. Amortized cost. You have to deduct your transaction cost. Okay. Now, so the actual amount of the loan, this is how you go step by step. Okay, step one. What is the amount of the bond? Nominal value, 10,000. Okay, step one. Okay, step one is the nominal value. I'm writing it down for you so that you write it somewhere. You start with the nominal value. Now deduct all your discount or any issue cost. Okay, it needs to be deducted first before you go through that table. Do you have any issue cost here? No, issue cost can be ignored in this case. But you have a discount. It was discounted 5%. Okay. So you have to discount at 5% means at 95% of this. Okay. So 95% of 10,000 will be what? After you deduct the in uh, discount, it will be 9,500. 
this is the amount from here you have to go ahead okay then step two is the table the table amortized table it's always like this since there is no issue cost i'm not deducting issue cost otherwise you have to further deduct the issue cost also all the discount you have to deduct because it was issued at a discount okay now let us go through table table is only for two years because it's a two years bond okay and it follows the similar structure all the table in fact opening balance balance brought forward then the finance cost fc then the cash paid and then the balance carried forward okay what are the year 31st december 2001 and 2 31st december 2001 31st december 2002 you start here with 9500 that's why you need this from here you proceed to the table it's always like this always whenever amortized table is there this is how you do it that's why i'm going a little slow in this one so that in the next two company i'll be going a little faster okay now comes your finance cost finance costs what did i tell you here finance cost is your effective rate of interest effective rate of interest is 10 percent you see here 10 percent so apply that 10 percent to what opening balance to the opening balance 10 percent so 10 percent to 9500 is 950 it's always like that always the effective interest is on the opening balance okay or shall i write it down for you always effective rate of interest on opening balance remember this always put it as a stomach put it somewhere don't forget once you add it add 950 with 9500 deduct the cash payment cash paid what did i tell you in the beginning it is what the coupon rate what is the coupon rate it's next to it always you will get it a two year two person this is the coupon rate even if they don't say mention coupon so two person on what always on the nominal value always on the nominal value never on this 9500 not on this 9500 it's on 10,000 the coupon coupon always on 10,000 so two person on 10,000 will be 200 and this is fixed by the way cash payment are fixed remember so it's 200 deduct even next year also is 200 you can close your eyes and put it it's fixed i told you this will not change only your finance cost changes every year so 9500 plus 950 minus 200 will give you 10250 you cannot go downwards you have to go horizontally like this because you need this closing balance to find the opening balance of the next year so that 10 to 50 becomes the opening balance of the next year on this again apply 10 percent the effective rate of interest which is 1025 already deduct 200 okay and get the amount how much will be the amount okay there is nothing to carry forward anyway we'll check what is the amount so it is 11.075 this one okay now with the same understanding in a similar way similar pattern except the numbers are changed percentages are changed wiggins wiggins raise finance by issuing 20 20 000, 6 is the coupon rate it's a four-year loan note this is a loan that was a bond but is the way they function is same this was also issued at a discount 10 percent at a premium of this much after four years effective is 12 percent issue cost this time we have thousand okay so wiggins okay how do you do wagons is the same amortized cost so you deduct your transaction from your uh, the cash that you have received what is the cash that you have received for wagon is 20,000 okay 
you deduct you have issued it at discount that is 10 percent so that means at 90 percent after deducting 10 percent you are left with 90 percent of 20,000 which is 18,000 okay so from this 18,000 deduct issue cost which is 1000 I suppose yes it's 1000 deducted so 18 minus 1000 is 17,000 this is your opening balance initially you recognize it at this initial recognition when you come to the subsequent then you come to the amortized table okay now remember this always for financial liability okay initially you like recognize it then amortize cost the table initially recognize like this then amortize the table now is the same maybe what i'm going to do is i'm going to keep this here change the date 4 5 31st december 2006 this is for four years starting with four okay so i'm going to rub this figure out and use the same table for the company okay except this time the effective interest rate is 12 percent okay so 17,000 was my balance 12 percent on it will be 2040 cash paid with c the coupon was six percent six percent on 20,000 i told always on nominal value right so six percent on 20,000 will be 1200 and it's fixed cash payment are fixed so all the four years 1200 you deduct 1200 1200 1200 in excel you can very easily do this in one click this will be 17 840 bring that here 840 apply 12 person okay 2141 then 18 7 8 1 bring it forward 18 7 8 1 again 12 person 2 2 5 4 then you get 19 8 35 19 8 35 2 3 80 which will be 21 0 1 50 okay see this figure this figure like this where is it this figure you can easily get it how it was at 20,000 and it was at premium if you add this you are getting this so that means through the table and like this you have to get the same figure that's how you know that this is correct this closing balance have to match with this one we didn't check with the first one let us check for the first one also first one was the first company hog premium was this nominal value was this so just add up the 10,000 and this I have cut the table but it was something 11 like this this was the figure it matched exactly it should always match okay now the third company Cavendish okay he is raising a finance zero coupon bond that means zero nominal value is 10,000 bomb will be renewed after two years premium this much issue cost is ignored effective rate of interest is seven percent okay again on the same table i'm going to do for this company what is the company cavendish but we have to find the initial this thing for cavendish initially you have to recognize it how much was it nominal value was 10,000 right there is no coupon nothing it was not discount or anything right there's no discount so or no issue cost so it's 10,000 only so you bring it down to this table okay what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this two line because it's only for two years I'm going to cut this completely off okay it is 2005 2005 and 2006 now i'm going to rub this figure okay now you start with 10000 here and effective rate was 7% here which is 700 there is no coupon so cash paid will be nil and you will be left with 10700 bring forward this next year 10700 apply 7% 749 no cash payment 
okay it's nil so you will be left with what 11449 sorry this will be the cash payment here because you are not going to carry forward the balance any longer entirely this amount so that your balance carried forward will be nil okay you see yeah okay wait i think it's very confusing what i'll do i'll rub all this rub the last two line okay. see this your cash paid your cash paid has to be equal to your actual payment the, the last cash paid not the balance carried forward your balance carried forward should always be nil sorry even for the previous two it's nil okay it's the cash paid if you add this and deduct your cash paid you will always get the closing balance as nil because it's going to be redeemed the liability will not be there you're not going to carry forward the liability any longer now we'll check whether it equates to this cash payment or not 11449 it was 10000 and premium so 10000 if you add the premium 1449 yes it is adding up you see it should be always like that that's how you know your table is perfectly all right there's a way of checking it you see if you're smart enough you'll be able to figure it out fair value through profit or loss okay now what just now we went through amortized cost but we also told that subsequently you can measure financial liabilities at fair value through profit and loss now we are dealing with the second part fair value through profit or loss we did a question also to show how to deal with amortized cost so that part is over now out of the money derivatives and liabilities that is held for trading are measured at fair value through profit and loss anything to do with trading see trading is for short term no usually within 12 months anything to do with trading this applies for financial asset as well anything for trading goes to profit and loss okay remember it like that then it becomes easy so liabilities held for trading are measured at fair value through profit and loss but in the earlier ones earlier example like bonds loan they were at amortized cost why see this kind of liabilities for borrowing they are usually not held for trading you give them for long term more than one year that's why it is at amortized cost and not fair value through profit and loss they, because they are not held for trading okay and out of the money derivatives what is out of the money derivatives for time being let's leave it forget about it when we go to derivatives later in this lecture i will explain what is out of money derivatives okay to know out of money you have first have to know in the money at the money and out of the money derivative okay now it is also possible to measure a liability at fair value even if normally it would have been measured at amortized cost only if it could eliminate or reduce an accounting mismatch okay in this case ifrs 9 says split the fair value component into two parts the moment in fair value is split into two components first component goes to other components of income second component goes to profit and loss which one goes to other components of income if the fair value changes due to own credit risk that means due to that financial liability that you are giving there's a risk that you will be unable to repay okay the risk then the entity which has issued that financial liability are now unable to repay or discharge it then any fair value changes due to that goes to other components of income okay the remaining fair value change which is not due to this own credit risk goes to profit and loss now let's do a question on this to understand this better before we move on to financial assets because we are over with financial liabilities you only need to remember two things in financial liability how to do the amortized cost and the fair value through profit and loss that's it with this understanding understand this properly because if you understood this this is like you are setting a ground okay and you are now sowing the seeds okay once you sow the seed properly then growing the tree growing up a small plant to a big tree is not a big thing in fact it becomes much easier it's more harder to plant that seed okay so that seed in the ground on a fertilized land 
this is what you are doing understand the concept of financial liability very well from the beginning itself not at the later stage once you understand this okay you will be able to apply some of these principles to financial asset also because major portion of financial instrument is on financial asset then on financial liabilities and later we are going to go through equity instruments debt instruments that's that, that time you need this information once again so you cannot forget okay now let us go to the question illustration 2 fair value through profit and loss so here on 1st of jan 2001 issued a financial liability nominal value is 10 million interest is payable at 5 percent liability is payable at 31st december 2003 and they trade in the short term at 31st december 2001 market rates of interest have risen to 10 percent okay so now what are you doing here since this is short term you know that this will go this is fair value through profit or loss okay get that thing cleared first now you have to remeasure to fair value the reporting date okay so since you don't have an active market to refer to get a fair value you have to calculate by discounting the future cash flows okay and the discount rate will be this one we'll be discounting at this the market rates of interest okay so this will be the date the cash flow the discount rate and the present value okay 31st december 2002 and 31st december 2003 okay because it's for two years okay now take five percent on 10 million okay interest so five percent on 10 million will be 0 0.5 million this will be the interest okay so here it will be 0 0.5 okay when you discount it it will be 1 divided by 1.1 because 10 percent so you multiply discount rate with the cash flow and present value will be 0 0.45 okay here you add 10 million because you'll be paying the principal amount with the interest so 10 plus 0 0.5 which will be 10.5 so you did 1.1 to the power 2 okay it will be 8.68 add up the 2 9.13 okay this is the fair value at the end of the year okay but in the first year since on 1st of jan 2001 okay it was 10 million Now you have found the present value okay you want to know at 31st december 2001 what would be the liability amount okay so you need to adjust it you have to reduce it from 10 to 9.13 okay so you see the liability will go down debit liability and credit profit or loss because the liability went down from 10 million to 9.13 the difference So the difference will be 0 0.87 million. This is how you do questions when it is fair value through profit and loss. Okay. Now let us do test understanding three. Test your understanding three. Okay. Here they invest in assets that are measured at fair value through profit and loss. Okay. And they have funded this purchase by issuing bond. But if the bonds were not remeasured to fair value there will be an accounting mismatch so due due to uh, to prevent that accounting mismatch what did been do they designated the bond to be measured at fair value through profit and loss why because bond normally we, we would be measuring it at amortized cost check my first question right amortized cost but because it is going to create an accounting mismatch okay so they have designated to keep on measuring it at fair value through profit and loss now the fair value of the bond felt 30 million 
and out of this 30 10 is because of their own credit worthiness how do you account for it okay so whenever there is a accounting mismatch yes you can choose fair value through profit or loss but then you have to split the fair value fair value needs to be split between two components oci and profit and loss oci will be due to its own credit risk okay fair value falling due to own credit risk and balance goes to pnl so out of this 10 so 10 will go to oci out of out of the 30 million drop and 20 will go to profit and loss 20 million okay so we are over with financial liability what you have to know is financial liabilities could be measured and amortized and fair value through profit and loss now we are moving on to financial asset so initially financial assets are recognized when and only when the entity becomes party to the contractual provision of that instrument okay examples number one when you are going for a commitment a trading commitment to buy or sell good is not recognized until one party fulfills their part one party of the contract has to fulfill their part okay so it is not when the sales so for example a sales order will not be recognized as a revenue and a receivable until the goods have been delivered goods have to be delivered first for you to recognize it as a revenue okay second regarding forward contract forward contracts are derivative financial assets okay they are derivative financial assets you must have studied forward from your financial management if you have not studied afm but still through your financial management you know what is what are forward contracts okay they are like commitments to buy something in future at a price that is set today that is the, that is the meaning of forward in short so forward is a derivative those things are called derivative forward option swap future okay in finance it is known as derivative so derivatives we are going to study in detail later on also okay just for now know that these are kind of derivatives okay so forward are financial assets but they are derivative financial assets okay and they are recognized on the commitment date not when the item under the contract is transferred you can transfer the uh, item under the contract later also doesn't matter which date but the day when you make the commitment that is the date you are going to recognize the financial asset same for the option contract it is not when the item under the con option you are going to receive no it is recognized the day the contract is entered into that is the day you recognize the financial asset option contracts are also derivative financial assets okay so for financial asset this is the thing you need to remember now we are moving on to another the third item we, we are finished with financial liability we are finished with financial asset now we are moving on to equity in instruments okay how do you account for equity in instruments classification equity in instruments means any investments in equity instruments like you are investing in equity ordinary shares and investment in ordinary shares of another entity this is an example of equity instrument okay they are measured at two things either fair value through profit or loss or fair value through other comprehensive income see how it is different from financial liability we don't have amortized cost here here fair value through profit and loss fair value through other comprehensive income okay fair value through profit and loss normally it is expected when you when there's a designation for this fair value through profit and loss now fair value through other comprehensive income okay when you designate for it you must comply with the following conditions number one the equity instrument should not be held for trading please see the connection oci not trading oci not trading remember this connection forever this will make your work very easy in case you forget what goes to profit and loss and what goes to other components of income okay if anything is held for trading goes to profit and loss anything not held for trading goes to other components of income this is the way you remember it next 
you make a choice and this choice you cannot reverse it it's fixed it's final irrevocable choice when you are initially recognizing the asset so on the initial recognition of the asset you make an irrevocable choice that you want to go through fair value through other components of income later on you cannot change it in the future it will be forever in other components of income that is the meaning of irrevocable now measurement how do you measure if it's fair value through profit and loss remember initially you measured at fair value and transaction cost are expensed to profit and loss are expensed and at the reporting date again you remeasure okay the asset is revalued to fair value and any gain and loss goes to profit and loss because it's fair value through profit and loss fair value through other components of income okay if it's other components of income this time transaction costs are added to the fair value see the difference transaction costs are added to the fair value okay and at reporting date before the disposal asset is again revalued to fair value but this time gain and loss will go to other components of income that is the only difference and this gain and losses will not be reclassified you cannot ever reclassify them to profit and loss it will forever stay there okay so this is all for equity investments let's summarize again fair value through other comprehensive income only if it's not held for trading second irrevocably designated otherwise everything goes through fair value through profit and loss now let us do a small question on this before we move on to debt in instruments test your understanding 5 americano in this question you need to discuss accounting as well as ethical issues raised by the above now please see that this question is very similar to your question number 2 in sbr the last question why because it's asking you an ethical question and two of your professional marks out of the five are here so you need to be very careful on how you not just what you write but how you write your answer okay now the directors of americano designated the entity's investment to be measured at fair value through other components of income on the ground that this minimizes volatility in profit and loss and thereby has a positive impact on their share price okay they argue that this accounting feedback enables them to fulfill their duty to maximize shareholder wealth they buy equity investments to trade in the short term can you see see whenever i will give you a hint whenever ethical issues is asked please understand there is always some error some incorrect thing that have happened something that means they didn't follow ifrs okay some incorrect is there which you need to correct that's why ethical issues are there otherwise issues were not raised if they would correctly record it or correctly recognize it in the first place okay and by reading the last line you clearly know what is the issue because it is to other components of income and it is trade in the short term doesn't go right doesn't fit together because we earlier told that when you are trading something it goes through profit and loss and not through other components of income but just one line is not enough to get full let's say this question is for 11 marks or 9 marks or 7 marks it's not enough you need to develop a habit of writing how do you write when you see the answer often most of you start panicking by looking at the length oh how do i start so today i'm going to teach you the technique on how to write answers especially ethical answers like this okay there's a way there's a format you can crack okay if you go through any ethical question it follows the similar pattern okay so what i'm going to do is i'm already going to write the keywords you can make up the paragraph on your own and write answers are there take your own time and read it because this is a exam like question that's why i'm focusing more on this question okay you first need to understand about what type of this one this is an equity investment so this is your starting point please always start with the subject understand what is the subject you are going to talk about then only you can write about elaborate on that this is about equity investment okay and measurement equity investments measurement okay so directly you can start with that point okay that equity investments 
are measured at fair value throughout the comprehensive income if the investment is not held for short term trading and irrevocable designation has been made so what are the keywords fair value other comprehensive income i'm writing the short form fb fair value oci other comprehensive income if two things are there this is this is in the first paragraph you are writing okay one and two what is it number one what is the number one not held for trading equity investment is the keyword here so you start from this point immediately start with that point only that they are you write through oci when held not held for trading and irrevocable election irrevocable election has been made okay in this two condition so you have to talk about this two condition in your answer but if in this answer what happens they are traded for short term so because they are traded for short term you have to write this also because it is traded for short term it goes through fair value profit and loss it goes through prof fair value through profit and loss it has to go through this okay so therefore america uh, americano should measure its investment in equity investments at fair value through profit and loss you have to give that statement this is first paragraph okay leave us line second paragraph what is second paragraph you are talking about ethical issue that was an accounting issue that you solved just now there is an and and means another requirement two requirements are there accounting you will get few marks for ethical issues you will get few marks let's say this question is for no 10 marks roughly so five marks for accounting five for ethical that's how normally it is divided okay so accounting issue you have just solved second paragraph now we are talking about ethical issue how do you how do you write it in terms of ethical by saying is not ethical it's unethical no don't use such phrases not only for this not for any question okay start talking about the director okay the director and the shareholder this relation first you talk about this okay so you can say that directors are appointed by shareholder so it is their duty to attain the best interest of the shareholder right duties of i am writing the keywords okay duties of directors towards shareholders this is in your second paragraph you are going to write okay because they are appointed by the shareholders they have a responsibility to attain the best interest of the shareholder this is shown by caring for maximizing a profit okay once you say that however use connecting words however dash what is it do they only have one duty they also have another duty what is it public interest they have an interest towards public public interest so when you're talking about public interest they have to produce financial statements that faithfully represent the financial position position uh, performance and cash flow okay faithfully represent this word has to be there faithfully represent the financial statements this is the key word this has to be there in your answer it comes from your conceptual framework you are getting key this are keywords don't forget you are going to get points for this marks are there okay so it is up to the accountants to not to breach the code of ethics and conduct they have certain code of ethics and conduct to comply with right they are bound by it now third paragraph i am writing three is third paragraph don't write three in your answer okay you are leaving online and going to the next you are going to talk about touching on what the five fundamental ecs code of ethics 
five fundamental code of ethics ACCS code of ethics ACC have given five fundamental code of ethics what are, what are they can you recall you have to talk about this which one out of this five are breached you have to talk about it there are five confidentiality yes objectivity integrity professional competence and due care professional behavior I'm not writing the five it's there you have to know it okay by hearted know the definition you don't have to write the definition you don't have to write all the five by saying these are the five fundamental is this is code of ethics no 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 you directly you have to jump to out of this five which one is breached check if you are going okay you are manipulating the measurement of financial asset how by showing something through other compressive income which you should have shown through profit and loss what are you doing you are simply manipulating manipulating my spelling might be wrong it's fine financial statement this is if you are manipulating financial statement measurement okay this you are breaching which of the five fundamental ACC code of ethics is it confidentiality no professional behavior no professional competence and due care and you competent enough no then objectivity no integrate when you're manipulating something knowingly you know it it's integrity you this has to be there in your answer you're getting marks for it you're breaching integrity integrity means being honest and straightforward even if you don't write the definition of integrate it's fine but you are breaching integrity here next if you are having a next code of ethics that is being breached go to the next paragraph and explain that one principle or one code of ethics in one paragraph next in length okay only 1.1 paragraph that's how the acca answer goes one point in one paragraph next are there anything that is breached see it is just not that you want to maximize profit okay okay you are not being honest that's fine another one by showing something through other comprehensive income you are manu you are biasing the result okay or it is biased towards showing a particular performance right so this demo demonstrates a lack of objectivity this is objectivity you're not being objective next is objectivity which is being breached because they are showing your answer towards one side you want to show in a favorable light lack of objectivity okay and finally comes your conclusion fourth is your conclusion sorry this is the fourth fifth is your conclusion this could be in one or two lines keep it very brief conclusion always very small okay what is it despite the director's claim about the impact on the shareholders well directors have an ethical responsibility to faithfully represent okay so this i will write it for you conclusion because you can modify it somewhat in your answer but you can use this kind of words in your answer see how they have concluded it okay therefore despite the director's claim okay you have to use the word directors because it is that it was the director's claim about the impact on shareholders wealth they said that this will positively impact shareholders wealth. so therefore despite the director's claim about the impact on shareholders wealth the directors have an ethical responsibility to faithfully represent see the words i'm using faithfully americanos use the company's name financial statement and how is this achieved this is achieved
this is achieved through compliance with IFRA standard that is IFRS 9 in this case that means you have to go through profit and loss not other comprehensive income through compliance with IFRS 9 standards IFRS standards this is how you end it any ethical answer okay now so we are finished with financial liability financial asset and equity instruments now we are moving on to debt in instruments okay debt in instruments can be measured in one of the three ways amortized cost fair value through other comprehensive income fair value through profit and loss if it's amortized cost okay this is how you decide whether an investment in a debt in instrument is measured at amortized cost or not you have to see the business model very important even in your exam look at the business model of the entity if the entity's business model is to collect the assets contractual cash flow that means they are not planning to sell the asset they are going to keep that asset until the maturity date okay then second the terms contractual terms of financial asset that means the cash flow that they are receiving is only the interest and the payment sorry interest and the principal amount solely this two okay then amortized cost for example the interest rate on convertible bond convertible bond is a debt in instrument it's a debt right so the interest rate on convertible bond will be lower than the market rate why because holder is getting the benefit to choose in cash or shares on redemption so in this case contractual cash flow is not solely principal and interest therefore you cannot use amortized cost for convertible bond you understand then for fair value through comprehensive income the business model is you are collecting and you are selling the financial asset you are selling when you are not selling amortized cost if you are selling other comprehensive income okay and most of the time you sell a debt instrument when you have a possibility of buying another investment at a higher return another debt instrument at a higher return so here also the cash the the contractual term means the payment that you are receiving is purely interest and the principal amount now let us do a small question on this test your understanding six in this question advise how the finance director on how the bond should be measured so he has purchased a new financial asset the asset is a bond which is going to mature in three years he buys the debt with the intention of holding them until maturity but on some occasions sold some investments if cash flow deteriorated beyond acceptable level they pay a market rate of interest so now they don't know whether they have to measure it at amortized cost or fair value through other components of income okay you have to see see for a debt instrument to be measured at amortized cost there are two things intention they have the intention of holding number one number two contractual cash flow is entirely the principal amount and the interest so in this case what is his objective objective is to hold the financial asset until maturity right they are holding the asset until maturity so it does not matter whether they sell in between they sell some investments if cash flow deteriorated okay it does not contradict this objective they still have this objective okay even if in between they are selling it does not contradict with this objective number one so number one is true number two what about the cash flow the bond is paying at a market rate of interest so market rate of interest means they are compensating it for the time okay time value of money and credit risk associated with the principal amount that is outstanding okay this market 
rate of return compensates for it both the time value and the credit risk this means the asset can be measured at amortized cost why because it is the interest as well as the principal amount this one so they are receiving solely principal amount and the principal interest and the principal amount so amortized cost reclassification okay sometimes what you can do is see financial assets are classified based on your initial recognition okay initially when you're recognizing something through fair value through profit and loss or fair value through other components of income or amortized cost it remains like that but sometimes you can reclassify you can change the classification how for example an entity wants to change its business model okay once you change your business model earlier you were holding the financial asset until maturity now you want to sell so once you change the business model your financial asset the affected financial asset also will be reclassified for example from fair value through profit and loss to amortized cost let's say you're changing but this change can only take place for investments in debt remember why see for equity in investment you cannot change anything from fair value through other comprehensive income to anything else next there is no amortized cost for equity investment in instruments it is only for debt in instruments that we have so you can only change fair value through profit and loss to amortized cost only for debt investment in debt remember that debt instruments now amortized cost when you're measuring it the debt initially it is fair value plus transaction cost here it is plus okay interest income this time because it's an asset on your asset see debt in instrument means what investment in a debt in instrument means you are giving you are giving debt to someone on which you are earning the income so it's an interest income for you you are receiving that income okay so this interest income is same way like financial liability is calculated using effective rate of interest there it was interest payment here it is interest income there it was interest cost that's the only difference but the way you calculate is on the effective rate of interest then fair value through other components of income here also initially fair value plus transaction cost same like amortized same interest income calculated using effective rate of interest okay but the difference come here at the reporting date assets will be revalued to fair value gain and loss will go to other components of income but see how it is different from equity instrument in equity instrument you couldn't reclassify to pnl but here you can reclassify to profit and loss when you are disposing the asset okay now fair value through profit and loss the difference is here in the earlier two you were adding the transaction cost to the fair value this time transaction costs are expensed to pnl okay but initially everything is at fair value next at the reporting date asset will be revalued to fair value and gain and loss will go to profit and loss this is something easy note on loss allowances if you are having a debt instrument that is either measured at amortized cost or fair value through other comprehensive income there will be a loss allowance that is our next topic loss allowance impairment of financial asset that is our next topic but it could the impairment on financial asset is only for debt in instruments that is measured at either amortized cost or fair value through other comprehensive income it is not for fair value through profit and loss you don't have loss allowance for those kind of debt instruments so in summary investment in debt amortized cost if contractual cash flow characteristics test passed what is the meaning of it contractual cash flow means the cash flow that you are getting should only have interest and principal solely and the business model to hold it until maturity other comprehensive income again you have to pass the cash flow inter only the interest and the principal but the business model is you are holding and you are selling profit and loss if it is neither amortized nor other comprehensive income now let us do questions before we move on to the impairment of financial asset test your understanding 7 tokyo so in this question you have been given three scenarios with three different business model you have to use amortized fair value through other comprehensive income and fair value through profit and loss 
okay this is a very good question to attempt because this one question will solve all your doubts on how to do a question if it's amortized cost or fair value through oci or fair value through profit and loss so a business model is to hold the bond until maturity which method should you use if you are holding it amortized cost get this fact straight away you should be able to tell once you see the business model which method you should use next one you are holding the bond but you are selling it okay holding the bond and selling so fair value through other comprehensive income next you are trading the bond for short term you are selling this bond for its fair value on 1st of jan 2002 this is fair value through profit and loss okay now you have been given the fair value of the bond on 31st december 2001 and 2 okay this you have to touch this figure only when you are using fair value for amortized cost we don't need it okay so we are coming to the information on 1st of jan 2001 tokyo bought a hundred thousand five percent bond for ninety five thousand. issue cost was two thousand interest received in areas the bond will be redeemed at a premium of this much effective rate of interest is eight percent so you have been given every information now you have to do the calculation and while you are doing the calculation you have to explain because read the requirement very carefully don't be in a hurry just to explain uh, sorry just to calculate explain with calculations how the bond will be accounted for over all the relevant years with calculation so you have to explain explanation part i'm leaving it up to you because the answers are there behind your textbook you can nicely read the explanation but while doing the calculation i'll be explaining you okay so let's start with a okay now so because it is amortized cost first you have to find when the asset is initially recognized okay so when the asset is initially recognized for a okay then you have to add your cost with all the transaction costs are added with the fair value so if you see it has been 95000 okay 100000 one five percent one for 95000 so with this 95000 see if it was financial liability you would have deducted the transaction cost but this is a financial asset okay investment in debt instruments but it's a financial asset you are giving a loan to someone that's why it's a debt instrument but for you it's a financial asset so you are adding up your transaction cost okay plus transaction cost so your transaction costs are your issue cost in this case is 2000 you are adding this it's always like this debt in instruments okay you have to add your transaction cost with the, so plus 2000 which is equal to 97000 so from here onwards you start the table okay you start the table the three dates year ended 31st december 2001 year ended 31st december 2002 year ended 31st december 2003 okay now the balance brought forward then we have on that we are going to charge interest at what percent effective interest rate eight percent okay it is this they have already given the effective rate of interest is eight percent then we have a receipt it's not cash outflow it's a receipt you are on the receiving side you are giving the bond so you're receiving it and then the carry forward balance remember this table okay memorize it this is how it's always going to be so brought forward will be this one that's why you need it 97,000. from here onwards you start so apply eight percent on 97,000. Which will be 7760 and receipt when you're working out the receipt you are working this the coupon rate so it's five percent on hundred thousand which is five thousand okay so it's five thousand so receipt 
So it's an addition. Oh, it's a receipt, but anyway, you have to deduct. Okay. Because they are giving you that 5,000, right? That receipt. So because of that receipt, it's C. C in this way. It's a debt. Okay. You are giving a loan to someone. You are giving a bond. So they are paying you now. Receipt. You are getting that receipt. So because of that receipt, your amount of your debt will reduce further. It's like they are uh, paying you the loan amount. So the loan amount, value of your loan, value of a liability goes down. That's why you're deducting the receipt 5,000 here. Understand this logic. Okay, that's why. So carry it forward will be 99,760. In Excel, you should be able to do it very quickly. Please do this in Excel and see how much of time you're taking. Becomes the carrying forward balance of 31st December 2001 becomes the opening balance of the next year. Again, apply 8% on it, which is 7981. This remains 5000, it's fixed, and 102,741. Then it's 102,741 here, 8219, 5000. There will be no carry forward balance, it will be nil because you have to pay off. Everything will be paid off. Okay, here. Finally, you are receiving, you are in addition to this, you are also receiving extra. What is it? The amount of the bond. 100,000 with it, you are adding the premium, 5960. So 100,000 plus the premium, 5960. It should be 105,960. 105,960. This is what you are going to receive at the end the entire amount and if you go by like this you add this and you deduct this you have to get a zero here it has to be always like this because at the end there's no balance to carry forward same for the financial liability also it works in similar way okay so now for each year so when you're going for 31st december 2001 what are you what are you recording this is an interest income Interest income of 7760 goes to PNL straight away. And what's next? Asset, the financial asset. What is the amount? This one 99760 goes to statement of financial position straight away. Okay. So like this, same pattern you have to apply for the other two years also. 31st December 2002. Interest income is this much. 7981 goes to PNL. This goes to statement financial position. The asset. 2003, this goes in the PNL. That's it. Right? Only it go, interest income goes to PNL. Nothing goes to statement of financial position. Now. With this understanding, we are going to go and do part B. Part B. This is fair value through other comprehensive income. Okay. Here is the same. Okay. For fair value through other comprehensive income, it is 97,000. It's the same figure you have to use. 97,000. Okay. The older thing is because it's fair value. Okay. This will change. Okay, I'm going to rub it for you in the same table only i'm going to do it okay see regarding the interest okay effective interest eight percent remains the same as as a okay as part a in part b also this will remain same interest will not change only the brought forward and the carry forward balance will change. Even the receipt will remain the same, 5,000. But you start with 97,000. Starting is same. So 97,000, this, this, this. Carry forward balance will be, oh, this time you will have another section. What is it? After receipt. Uh, after receipt, you should have a gain and a loss because it's fair value. So total, then gain or loss. Then we have the carried forward balance. Okay, so if you add up this total here, it will be 99,760. But if you go here and see, 
carry forward balance should be 110 for 2001. This is the fair value of the bond. So it's, it should be here 110,000. Check out the difference between these two. This is a financial asset. Okay. So if you see closing balance is more, it's an asset. See it from the point of an asset. Value is more, it's a gain. It's a gain. Value went up. Carry forward balance is more. So the gain is the difference between these two, which is 110,000 minus 99,760 is the gain. What is it? 10 to 40. So the gain is 10 to 40. It's a gain. Now 110,000. So here also it will be 110,000. The total will be 112,981. This time also they have given you the carried forward balance, which is 104,000. But this time, if you see from 112,981, value went to 104,000. It's a loss. So the difference is the loss. Okay. It is 8,981. This is the loss. And when you are coming here, it will be 104,000. Okay, and when you are coming here, okay, receipt, please understand here it will be 105,960 because 100,000 plus that premium. This will be same in all the three years, this amount. Okay, so if you check the total, this 104 plus the interest minus this amount, you will be left with. 1, 2, 5, 9. So, there will be nothing nil. So, it's a loss. 1, 2, 5, 9. This is a loss. Okay, this will be the table. Now, the explanation will be same like part A. That this figures will go to profit and loss. Okay, each year. Correct? Year by year, you have to explain in different paragraphs. In the year and 31st December 2001, this will go to PNL, this will go to other competency income, this will go to statement of financial position. Like that, you have to explain. For 2002, like this, like this, like this. 2003, like this, like this, like this. Okay? So everything remains the same except this. I will highlight it for you. These are evaluation gain or losses. Only these three, three things are new in part B. Where will this go? OCI, other comprehensive income. This figure will go to statement of financial position. So every year you have to write. Okay. Now we are coming to part C. It is you are trading it for short term profit and loss and you are selling it on 1st of Jan 2002. Okay. So now when you are taking it, there is a difference here. Difference will be for part C. This time, it will be only be 95,000. Okay. Path C is only 95,000. You are not taking the issue cost and adding it. Why? Because the issue cost, issue cost 2,000 goes to profit and loss. They will be expensed. And this only happens when it's fair value through profit and loss. Fair value through profit and loss. In this all the transaction like issue cost for example goes to PNB. They are expensed. You do not add it with the fair value. So fair value remains 95,000. Okay. Now so for here you don't have to make that table. It's not required. Okay. 31st December 2001. What happened? Interest income will be 5,000. We have already calculated it, right? 5% of 100,000. That's 5,000. This will go to PNL. There's no doubt. This will remain the same. Okay. Asset would be revalued to 110,000. Why? Because at that date, look at the fair value. At that date, the fair value is 110,000. So it's revalued to 110,000. What is the value? Initially 95,000. So from 110,000 minus 95,000. It was revalued upwards. What is the gain? 15,000, right? 
15,000 gain. Where does it go to? PNL. Because this is, even though it's a revaluation, but it's fair value through profit and loss. So the gain will go in, revaluation gain will go through profit and loss. Now, when you're selling it off, you're selling it for the fair value. That means you're selling it for 110,000. So when you're selling it for 110,000, on this date, 1st of Jan 2002, cash proceeds, of 110,000 this much you are receiving and financial asset what's happening when you are selling the financial asset financial asset would be d recognized you have to you write this word now you are no longer going to recognize the financial asset you are selling it off so you are receiving the cash and you are recognizing the financial asset please do this question on your own if you find a similar question like this in your past paper or revision kit, please do it. It's very important that you get the pattern set from the beginning itself before we proceed more. Because as more and more we go further, okay, we are going to learn new, new things so that you might forget all these things. Yeah. The next one will be impairment of financial asset. Okay. Next, test understanding eight. Okay. This is not like test understanding seven it's little different and it's easier okay so that's the thing once you're over with the tough part okay doing easy things makes more sense okay now on 1st of jan 2001 magpie lends 2 million this loan is interest free and it will be repaid in two years time as it is classified at amortized cost no transaction fees market rates of interest are eight percent Loss allowance can make note. You have to say how this accounting entries will be done in 31st December 2001. That's the question. Okay. So please understand. Okay. Whether this loan, you always need to understand the nature. Whenever they give, don't immediately apply IFRS 9. Don't jump to a conclusion to use IFRS 9. First, see whether it's a financial asset or a financial liability. If it's not, then there's no point of using IFRS 9. First, understand this loan. Whether it's a financial asset or not, understand this. You first have to write that in your answer. So this loan, okay, this loan in this question is a financial asset. You are giving the loan to someone else. You are not taking a loan. Okay, Don't get confused with loan and financial liability. I know that pattern that has been set in your mind. Loan means liability. Loan means liability. You are not taking a loan. You are giving the loan. You are lending a loan. That means you are getting the return. Okay. Why this is a financial asset? Give reasons. Because Magpie have a contractual right. Okay. The word contractual right. When you are giving a loan, you have a contractual right, right? You have you have a right to receive cash. Whenever you have a contractual right to receive cash in any through any way, loan, bond, debenture, whatever shares, it's a financial asset okay contractual right magpie please mention the name of the company magpie has a contractual right to receive cash in two years time that's why it's a financial asset now you apply ifrs 9 so initially initially okay second paragraph initially we'll recognize it at fair value because all financial asset or financial initial recognition is fair value please remember this okay so financial assets i'm using short form fa but you don't use it okay are initially recognized at fair value okay see so in this case you cannot easily get the fair value why did they give you the fair value no if you see market rate of interest is eight percent right you have to ma make sure that this is mentioned in your answer i'm not writing it please check the answer answers are there but i'm just explaining you what do you have to write market rates are eight percent that means market participants would receive eight percent on this type of loan but if you see the loan that has been made to the supply is interest free it's not in line with the market it's interest free so that means this transaction was not done at the fair value correct so that means the financial asset will not be recognized at this price because this is not a fair value 
instead you have to estimate the fair value now how by finding the discount you have to discount the cash flow that's how you do you calculate the present value of the future cash flow from the loan okay so now you start doing it it's 2 million right you discount it multiply by 1 divide by 1 point c you have to discount it using this rate only market rate 8 percent and it's for two years time in two years time so one plus eight percent that means it will be 1.08 to the power two because for two years this is how you find the present value which will be 1.71 okay so the entry will be you debit financial asset 1.71 you debit profit and loss We'll leave the figure because it's a balancing figure you credit cash how much you're lending 2 million so the difference you are lending 2 million financial is debit and profit and loss will be it's a loss of 0 0.29 the difference now that's not enough okay this is initially but subsequent measurement financial asset is subsequently measured you have to use these words okay in your answer subsequently measured at amortized cost how do i know amortized cost through two things i will understand one look at the business model if the business model is holding it until redemption amortized cost but in this question they have already told that it will be measured at amortized cost already they told so it's easy one either in the question they will tell you directly otherwise they will give you the business model and then you will know so that means that table only for one year you have to do it 31st december It is 31st December 2001. Okay. So on that date, okay, it will be 1.71. This is 1st of Jan 2001. 1.71. You are getting it from here. This amount 1.71. Interest of 8%. See earlier you are using that interest to discount now you are using the same interest to find the interest income this eight percent only okay because no other interest has been mentioned so interest at eight percent eight percent of one point seven one is zero point one four receipt you see there'll be no receipt why because interest free loan interest free loan there's no coupon rate if there was a coupon rate you would have got the receipt so it's nil so by thirty first December two thousand one just add it will be 1.85 okay so now this interest income you have to record debit financial asset 0 0.14 credit profit and loss it's again 0 0.14 your financial asset value will further go up you have to increase it up to 1.85 that's why you're debiting 0 0.14 and you're crediting it because it's an interest income okay so please understand why again this is zero because loan is interest free interest free means you're not receiving any cash okay so by 31st december 2001 financial asset will be at 1.85 and what about 31st december 2002 financial asset will have a carrying amount of 2 million understand this and this amount will then be repaid by the supplier because they told in two years time this amount will be you'll be lending this amount so it will be repaid by a supplier by the end that's why we know that carrying amount initially will increase up to 2 million and then supplies will entirely pay off this 2 million so now we are moving on to the impairment of financial asset
impairment of financial assets okay loss allowances like any other asset whether it's tangible or intangible same for financial assets also we have impairment but what you need to remember is that this impairment is only for debt instruments financial assets that are debt instruments not equity only debt instruments okay and debt instruments which are measured at amortized cost or fair value through other comprehensive income only for this two impairment is there now if the credit risk on the financial asset has not increased significantly okay since the initial recognition the loss allowance should be equal to 12 month expected credit losses please understand if the risk does not increase significantly 12 month expected credit losses that should be your loss allowance if the credit risk increases significantly then it is the lifetime expected credit losses we'll see in the next slide what are the terms credit risk loss allowance this 12 month and lifetime expected credit losses then you have to make adjustments to the statement of profit and loss what are these adjustments okay so adjustments to the loss allowances are charged to the statement of profit or loss okay next unless credit impaired interest income is recognized on the assets cross carrying amount example sorry yeah excluding the loss allowance excluding the loss allowance means from the assets carrying amount that means the financial assets carrying amount you do not deduct the loss allowance no so when you're calculating interest income see on what amount do you calculate interest income on the opening balance right the on the carrying amount of the asset so this carrying amount of the asset okay it is the gross gross means you do not deduct loss allowance net carrying amount means you deduct the loss allowance and then you calculate interest income but this is only when your assets are not credit impaired that means the credit risk did not increase significantly okay interest income is the effective you have to use the effective rate of interest to calculate interest income we have done this right now the definition very important the four definition these are the four definition that you have to know credit loss what is credit loss credit loss means when there's a difference between the contractual cash flow and the cash flow that entity expects to receive there's a difference it's not the same the amount that you expect to receive is something else and you are actually receiving is less than that then it's a credit loss okay expected credit losses are the weighted average credit losses lifetime expected credit losses means when the expected credit losses that result from all possible default that means from all the conditions you can conclude that your financial assets risk has increased significantly the credit risk 12 month expected credit loss is just a portion of that lifetime expected credit losses that might occur for 12 months after the reporting date just a portion okay we are definitely going to do questions on this so do not worry next significant increases in credit risk okay to see this to assess this that whether the credit risk increased significantly or not ifrs 9 says you have to compare how can you say it increased significantly you have to compare you have to compare at the reporting date what was the assets risk of default and at the date of initial recognition what is the risk of default you have to compare this two one on the reporting date the other one on the initial recognition the assets risk of default entities should not solely rely on past information when determining if credit risk has increased significantly or not no third if see see it's normal for an entity to assume that credit risk will not increase significantly for those instrument that already has a low credit risk at the reporting date it's very unlikely right having low credit is suddenly it will increase so much but if they have then if the credit risk is high already at the initial recognition then yes it makes sense that it will increase significantly now 
credit risk can be assumed to have increased significantly if the contractual cash flow takes more than 30 days to be paid. Okay, if it's more than 30 days, credit risk increases significantly. Now let us do a question on this. Test your understanding nine. So in this, you are supposed to discuss the account treatment of the bond. Okay. Here they have issued a bond, San Friends. Now they they hold the financial asset until maturity, and they deem to have low credit risk. But because there were some adverse changes in economic environment, it is having impact on their liquidity. Let's see what are the information. Sales have declined of 15% over the past six months. External agencies are reviewing its credit rating, but no changes have yet been made. And although bond prices have remained static, San Francisco's bond price, this is the market bond price. San Francisco's bond price have fallen dramatically. Okay, the market's bond price are static. Static means they didn't change. So now, how are you going to explain this? So you have to first see whether the credit risk increased significantly or not from the date of inception. Okay, credit risk of the bond. Then you can see that performance has declined, right? Decline of 15%. That means performance has declined. This can have an impact on their liquidity, right? It is having an impact. So you can talk about it next about the review part. So because they are reviewing this, that means they are more concerned about the performance and the position of the company, right? Then the bond price. Mention this third point. Okay, even though the market bond price is static, but San Francisco bond price, there's a decline. Okay. So because it has fallen drastically, there's a decline. You can say that this is likely to be a response to San Francisco's increased credit risk. Maybe the credit risk increased significantly, right? It could be a response to that. So now you can give a conclusion that based on the above, it looks like that credit risk has increased significantly, right? It's no longer a low credit risk. Looking at all the facts from the bond price to external agency rating and to the performance of the decline, right? It seems that now the credit risk increased significantly. Okay. So because credit risk increased significantly, what should you do? How do you account for it? Recognize loss allowance. Okay. You have to recognize a loss allowance. Equal to what? Equal to lifetime. It's because it increased significantly, it's a lifetime, not 12 month. Lifetime expected credit losses on the want. Now let us do test understanding. Yeah. Test your understanding 10. Okay, so here you have to discuss the current accounting treatment. Okay, of this. James trade receivables are short term and do not contain a significant financing component. Okay, now using historical observed default rate, they have dated for changes in forward looking estimate. Okay, so they have given not over do you want 30 days, 31 to 60 days over what would be the default rate. Now coming to the gross carrying amount they have given you. There's a loss allowance of 0 0.2 million that has been brought forward from the previous financial year. Okay, you need to understand that trade receivable are financial asset. So according to IFRS 9, you have to deal. And at what cost? Normally it is measured at amortized cost. Okay. Now, 
how are you going to calculate the expected credit losses you have been given the probability and you have been given the amount so just multiply okay multiply the expected risk of default with the carrying amount right and since because receivers are for short term you don't have to discount them okay now lifetime expected credit losses let's do that it's lifetime okay now so not overdue not overdue means you have to multiply this to 0.5% with 10.1 that's how you multiply the default rate with the gross carrying amount multiply so it would be 10.1 into 0.5% which would end up to 0 0.05 all these are in millions and then we have 1 to 30 days overdue, overdue. which is 4.3 into 1.5 percent 0 0.06 then 31 to 60 days 1.6 into 6.1 percent 0 0.10 then we have more than 60 days okay one into 16.5 percent if you it will be 16.5 percent so we will show it as 17. okay round up rather than showing 0 0.165 it's better to show 0 0.17 rounding up to two decimal places now it would be 0 0.3 8 okay so the, this would be the allowance 0 0.38 that you need to recognize but the current allowance already you have recognized 0 0.2 because you have carried it forward from the previous year and it has increased further to 0 0.38 okay so the difference 2 minus 0 0.38 wait is it 2 0 0.2 sorry difference is 0 0.18 okay so this 0 0.18 is an expense which goes to PNL the incremental amount okay now if the asset is credit impaired okay you have to compare okay the difference between the assets gross carrying amount and the present value of the expected future cash flow when discounted at the original effective rate of interest okay and IFRS 9 also suggests some events which says that asset might be credit impaired. Number one, where borrower or issuer are having significant financial difficulty. A breach of contract such as a default. Borrower being granted concession. It is becoming probable that borrower will enter bankruptcy. So in all this four, asset is credit impaired. Okay, and if the asset is credit impaired, you have to calculate the interest income on the assets and net carrying amount remember earlier we told that if the asset is not credit impaired interest income is calculated on the assets 
cross carrying amount here if it is credit impaired it is the assets net carrying amount that's the difference net carrying amount means you deduct from the gross carrying amount you deduct less allowance you deduct the loss allowance that's what you do and on that you calculate interest income which is based on effective rate of interest now let us do a question test your understanding 11 napa so here you are supposed to discuss the accounting treatment of the financial asset at 31st december 2001 please go a little slow in this once from here onwards because the questions from here inwards are going to be a little tricky and a little difficult to understand in the first instance you need to reread it okay so go a little slow on 1st of jan 2001 they purchased a bond of 1 million measured at amortized cost interest was 10 percent repayable on 31st december 2003 effective rate of interest is 10 percent so it's the same okay coupon rate and the effective rate are 10 percent napa received 31st december 2001 they received interest of 100000 that is 10 percent of 1 million probability of default within the next 12 months is 0.5 percent if default occurs within the 12 months then napa estimated that no further interest will be received and that only 50 percent of the capital will be repaid on this one their credit risk is low okay now how do you start with this the credit risk increased significantly or not no because if it would if it would have increased significantly they would have given you the lifetime expected credit losses they give you 12 months and also said the credit risk is low okay so the credit risk did not significantly increase okay let's write it down did not increase significantly so creditors did not increase significantly means what loss allowance is equal to 12 month expected credit losses Credit loss. Okay, you can use 12 month expected credit loss. Now, let's find the credit loss. Okay, you have to work the credit loss. How? Date. 31st December 2002 and 31st December 2003 and 31st December 2003 now expected cash shortage discount rate you have to discount it and the present value this is how you do you find the present value so the cash shortage the interest only you are receiving which is hundred thousand hundred thousand hundred thousand but in 2003 you are also receiving 50 percent of the capital that means 50 percent of this one million which is five hundred thousand okay they told if default occurs within next 12 months then nafa estimates that no further interest will be received and only 50 percent of the capital will be repaid on 31st december 2003 which is 500,000. Okay, discount rate is 10%. For three years. 
okay so you multiply the cash shortage into discount rate and find the present value 9909 add up the present value it is 586777 this one okay this is the credit loss that we have been working out this is exactly how you have to do when you are given the cash you have to find the present value of it that is the credit loss okay now what is the expected credit this is a credit loss on the asset the expected credit loss expected the moment you see the word expected you have to know that there's a probability that is there you have to work around probabilities okay expected credit loss so the moment you see the word expected probability is there that is you're multiplying the credit loss by the probability so here it is five eight six seven 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 multiplied by what what is the probability of occurrence 0.5 percent that is going to default within 12 months so 0.5 percent okay so if you take 0.5 percent of this it will be 2934 okay that means this is an impairment loss also this loss will create an impairment loss because this is what impairment of financial asset only the moment you have credit loss and all it's an impairment so impairment loss of 2934 will go to pnl account profit and loss okay now let us find the net carrying amount of the financial asset in the statement of financial position because it was impaired there's a net carrying amount in your statement of financial position it will be the net carrying amount of financial asset on the statement of financial position what was the amount of the bond 1 million you deduct the 293 for the expected credit loss which will be 997066 in your statement of financial position this is the amount of your financial asset which will go now Remember, interest in the future period will continue to be charged on the gross carrying amount on this 1 million in the future. Okay. Why? See, the credit risk did not increase significantly because we are only finding the 12 month expected credit losses. So we work out the interest in on this gross carrying amount, not on the net. When you're finding the interest because the risk did not increase significantly it is only a 12 month expected credit loss okay now so we have done the working that's it now we'll be moving on to test understanding 12 how they should be accounted for first of feb 2006 they made a four-year loan of 10,000. coupon rate is six percent effective rate is also six percent then on first of feb 2009 that is six seven eight after three years after four years six seven eight nine they had a significant financial difficulty current market rate is eight percent no more interest only six thousand they estimate that they will receive no more capital. It also estimate that only 6,000 of the capital will be repaid on the redemption date. They recognize a loss allowance of 1,000 already. So now, let's see. How should this be accounted for? You have to write. Calculation is not enough. Okay. So because there are significant financial difficulty, that means significantly it has increased. Right? So now, what 
Remember, this time the coupon and the effective interest rate are the same. Because they are same, carrying amount of the asset will remain at 10,000. Because the effective and the coupon rate are 6%. They are same. Okay. Now let's find out the like the previous one. You have to find the present value of the future cash flow. So present value of future cash flows discounted using effective rate. You have to use effective rate always to discount. Okay. So future cash flow only 6000 you are receiving. Okay. And when you are discounting it, it will be 1 divided by 6%. 6 to the power 2. I'm sorry, not 2. It's just 6. Because you are discounting it for 1 year. Okay. Just see here. So it will be 5660. Okay. Now, this is expected credit losses. That's what you're finding. Okay. So you have to deduct this from the amount because you need the net figure, right? So 10,000 minus this figure, expected credit. Sorry, this is not expected credit loss. Now, what you are going to find will be the expected credit loss, okay? It will be the, this one. 4, 3, 40, the expected losses. So this, at this amount, you have to recognize a loss allowance. Okay. Already you have recognized here 1000. So you have to increase this to this amount up to 4340. Right. So the difference only will go to profit and loss. 4340 minus 1000. So 3340 will go to PNL. Okay. You have to increase your loss allowance this amount now because the you can say the asset is credit impaired so interest income will now be calculated on the net amount okay so what is the gross carrying amount let's find the net amount 10,000 minus the allowance which is 4340 the total which will be 5660 okay take us to 5660 so it is 560 you have to find on this this is the net amount. Okay. So consequently, the last year of the loan, the interest income will be recognizing profit and loss. In last year of loan, interest income will be how much? This you have to take the effective interest rate six percent because this is the net amount, right? So on that you charge what six percent. So once you apply the effective rate, you are going to get the interesting come up. 340. This will go to PNL as an interest income. One is loss allowance, don't forget, the other one is interest income. Okay.
purchased or originated credit impaired financial asset what happens when the financial asset that you have bought is already credit impaired on initial recognition that time the interest income that you calculate should be by using credit adjusted effective interest rate see normally you use effective interest rate this time you have to do credit adjusted effective interest rate to calculate interest income second the credit adjusted effective interest rate incorporates all the contextual terms of financial asset as well as the expected credit losses that means higher the expected credit losses lower the credit adjusted effective interest rate it's opposite third since credit losses anticipated at inception will be recognized through credit adjusted effective interest rate see whatever happens right credit losses that you anticipate at inception it is already reflected in your credit adjusted effective interest rate that means higher the credit risk lower the interest rate so the loss allowance on purchased credit impaired financial asset should be measured only as the change in the lifetime expected credit losses since initial recognition that means when you're calculating the loss allowance this time for those type of assets you only have to see when the lifetime expected credit losses changes since initial recognition only when it changes then you recognize the loss allowance right next debt in instruments at fair value through other comprehensive income this is the second type of debt in instruments that could be that where financial assets could be impaired here because the assets are held at fair value so you do not deduct the uh, you do not deduct anything from the carrying amount of the asset okay loss allowance are not deducted from the carrying amount of the asset in the financial statement instead that allowance goes through other comprehensive income let's do a question now test your understanding 13 okay this is your fair value through other comprehensive income and expected losses how do you revaluate explain how the revaluation and impairment of the financial assets should be accounted for okay so here they purchase a debt in instrument for 1000 on 1st of jan 2001 the interest rate is same as effective rate and 31st December 2001 still the bond is at 1000 at 31st December 2001 the year end fair value went down to 950 okay there was there was not any significant increase in the credit risk so they used 12 month expected credit losses this is deemed to be at 30 how do you account for it see Fair value went down from 1000 to 950. Already there's a loss, okay? Loss of 50. There's a loss of 50. This is a loss. Where will it go to? Other comprehensive income because this is fair value through other comprehensive income. So it will go to OCI loss. You debit. OCI 50 and your credit financial asset FA 50. Okay. Now, what about the credit loss? 12 month expected credit loss 30. You debit the 13 PNL, where do you credit? You do not deduct it from the carrying amount of the asset. Instead, you credit that in other comprehensive income. So, debit impairment. impairment loss through pnl 30 and you credit this time in oci okay so overall impact if you see oci is debit 50 credit 30 so 50 and 30 50 minus 30 20 so cumulative loss cumulative loss in oci is 20 50 minus 30 okay the fair value change in 50 is offset by the impairment amount of 30 
simplifications now ifrs 9 has allowed some simplification number one loss allowances should always be measured at an amount equal to lifetime credit losses but for what for trade receivable and contract asset only for these two things you measure it always at lifetime credit losses there is no option of choosing 12 month or lifetime it is always lifetime credit losses only for trade receivable that is your debtors and contract asset contract asset is those that are recognized according to ifrs 15 okay but if they do not have a significant financing component in your exam they will tell you whether they have a significant financing component or not if it does not then lifetime but okay for lease receivable as well as trade receivable and contract assets with the significant financing component if they have a significant financing component then entity can choose whether to measure it at lifetime expect lifetime credit losses or not okay now impairment reversal it's quite often that sometimes it could be reversed right at that time you need to recalculate your loss allowance at each reporting date second it may be that allowance okay was previously equal to lifetime expected credit losses now it is changed to 12 month expected credit losses why because credit risk reduced that time it was high credit risk now it reduced so now from lifetime to 12 month when this change happens there's a substantial reduction in the allowance required you can see that your allowances are reducing third because of this you're going to have some gain on loss right so gain on loss on the remeasurement of the loss allowance go through profit and loss okay now so that's it with impairment of financial asset now we are moving on to another part that is a de-recognition of financial instruments both financial asset and financial liability are de-recognized if certain conditions are there for financial asset if contractual right of receiving the cash is no longer there it's expired for example earlier you were having an option now that option is no longer there either it has elapsed or lapsed or it became worthless second reason could be you are selling off the financial asset when you are selling off please make sure that all the risks and rewards of the ownership of that asset are also transferred from seller to buyer if this too happens then only you de-recognize okay but if not okay if you are retaining the risks and rewards you should not de-recognize the financial asset even if you are selling even if you are legally selling the financial asset if you are having the risk and rewards of the ownership of the asset with you you should not de-recognize the asset you you should still recognize the asset ifrs 9 says that financial instrument is consistent okay is consistent with the conceptual frameworks regarding the derecognition part it goes ifrs 9 goes with the conceptual framework in terms of derecognition now let us shift to financial liability with the same understanding that we have for financial asset is the same it's just it's the opposite here it's the obligation okay you derecognize financial liability when the obligation is discharged that means you no longer have an obligation either it is discharged or cancel or gets expired and this is the accounting treatment okay so the difference whenever there is a derecognition this is the accounting treatment the difference between the carrying amount of that asset or a liability and the amount that you have received or paid that difference is recognized as a profit and loss okay next for investments in equity investment equity instrument sorry for investments in equity instrument which is held at fair through other comprehensive income all the cumulative gain and losses in the other comprehensive income are not reclassified to profit and loss on disposal the difference in debt in instrument is they are reclassified any debt in instruments that goes through other comprehensive income 
the gain and loss are reclassified to profit and loss once they are sold off, once they are disposed. That is the only difference. In equity instruments, not reclassified to profit and loss. Debt in instrument, yes, it is reclassified to profit and loss. So let's do three questions. Before we move on to our next topic that is derivative, another very interesting topic. Test your understanding 14. Here we are going to do three test your understanding 14, test your understanding 15, and test your understanding 16. Test your understanding 14 is about two factoring arrangements. Okay, what is factoring? Factoring means when you are hiring a person to collect your debt on behalf of you and you are paying a commission to this factor. Okay, so there are two factors. Okay, now this is about a receivable. Okay, Mink has two receivable that it has factored to a bank in return of immediate cash proceed. It has factored it to a bank. So bank is going to receive and give it to Mink. Okay, now let's see. The first receivable is for 200,000. Okay, Mink had received 180 from the factor. And what are the terms of this? The term is that Ming will not have to repay this money even if the customer does not settle the debt. And this is said, the factoring arrangement is said to be without recourse. You don't repay. Second receivable is for 100,000. Ming has received 70,000. And Ming will receive a further 5,000 if the customer settles the account on time. Okay. Now, if the customer does not settle the account, then the receivable will be resigned back to Ming, who will then be obliged to refund the factor with the original 70,000. This is said to be factor arrangement with recourse. So, these are the two factoring this thing. Now, tell me how do you account for it? Let's deal with the first, okay, the 200,000. The question here is about receivable, right? You have to know this whether you have to de recognize or not. Okay. This is regarding receivable, trade receivable. So, for trade receivable, this is trade. Trade receivables. Okay. When it's about trade receivable, the important question you need to ask is Are you transferring or are you selling off all of your risks and rewards to the factor? Okay. If yes, you de recognize the receivable. If no, you do not de recognize. So in the first one, you have to see the 200,000 receivable here. Are you transferring the risks and rewards? Is Ming transferring it to the factor? Okay, in this case, the risk would be bad debt, right? That could be a risk regarding to trade receivable. Main risk of trade receivable is what? Bad debt. So now the first arrangement. If you see 180,000 and if you see the mink is not going to repay. So who is bearing the risk? Ultimate risk is borne by whom? The factor. The factor is going to bear the risk. So in this case, okay, the risk and the reverse. That means the risk of bad debt has been passed from mink to factoring, factoring bank. Okay. So because it has been passed, to bank is the one who is going to suffer because mink is not going to make any more arrangement right M Ming is not going to repay that amount whether the customer pays or not so here Ming has to de-recognize Ming should de-recognize because he has transferred the risk of bad date to the factoring bank Ming should de recognize 
okay ming should de recognize what the receivable so if you see the difference receivable was for 200000 ming has already received 180000 what is the difference 20000 is the risk 20000 this 20000 they have to de recognize okay so there will be an expense of 20000 recognized 20000 expense recognized okay they should de recognize what the receivable This is regarding the first arrangement. Now the second arrangement. In the second arrangement, you see they are topping up the payment, okay? And in fact, if the customer settles the account on time, Ming is going to receive a further 5,000. So you see the risk and rewards still stays with the mink. They didn't transfer it to the factor in the second arrangement. You understanding? And money received are refundable in the event of default. So that means it represents an obligation. Okay. Even if, okay. So despite the passage of legal title over the receivable even if the legal title is with the factor on receiving the receivable still the risk and rewards of slow payment and bad date stays with mink in this case okay so that means you should not de-recognize you should keep continuing to recognize this in the second arrangement okay so in substance, Ming has done what? Ming has borrowed 70,000. They have received 70,000 from the factor means what? They have borrowed the 70,000 from them. It's like a loan. So you have to recognize this immediately. Immediately you should recognize. Okay. Immediately recognize this. The 70,000. It's like a loan you are taking. Okay. It's like a borrowing. So, because it's a loan, what happens? It increases the gearing of MIC. Gearing of MIC will increase. Okay. Gearing means when your debt increases, your financial risk increases. That is the meaning of gearing. Now, let us go to test your understanding 15. Okay. So, test your understanding 15. Advise the directors of case as to the acceptability of the above accounting treatment. Case holds equity investments at fair value through profit and loss. Okay. Due to the short term cash flow shortages, they sold some equity investments for 5 million. Carrying amount was 4 million. Okay. The terms of the disposal state that case has the right to repurchase the shares at any point over the next two years at their fair value on the repurchase date. Case has not de recognized the investment because the debtors believe the repurchase is highly likely. Okay. So now, what do you suggest? An entity has transferred a financial asset. If it has transferred the contractual right also to receive the cash flow from that asset, then only you can say it has transferred its financial asset. Okay, it's very important because this is regarding transfer of financial asset and liability. Okay, this is a financial asset. So now, if you have transferred, you have to see who is bearing the risk and reward of that financial asset. Okay. If they have also transferred the risk and rewards, then yes, de recognize a financial asset. Otherwise, you have to recognize. Okay. And remember, gain and losses on disposal. Okay. Gain and losses on disposal. 
goes to BNL. So in this case, okay, let's see the case. Do, does he have an obligation to buy back the shares? No, no obligation. He has no obligation. If he wants, he can buy, but he has no obligation to buy back the shares. Okay, so because he has no obligation to buy back the shares, that means he is protected from any future share price decline. You understand? And even if the case does repurchase the share, they will be at fair value. You see, at fair value, it is not at a some fixed price, pre-fixed price. So he is not having any risk or reward relating to the price fluctuations on the share price. You understand? So because the risk and rewards are have been transferred, what happened? Case should be recognized. Case should be recognized. The financial asset, the FA. Okay. Once you derecognize the financial asset, you have to recognize a profit. Remember, you are selling it for five million. Carrying amount was four, so it's one million profit. And this goes to profit and loss account. This one million profit goes to profit and loss account. Now, test your understanding. Sixteen. Jones bought an investment in equity share. This is also an equity for forty million plus transaction cost of one million. Asset was designated as payable through other comprehensive income. This is through other comprehensive income this time, not profit and loss. That's the difference. Fair value increased to sixty million and was sold for seventy million. A. How should the investment be accounted for? B. If it went through fair profit and loss, how it would be different? If it was classified as fair value through profit and loss. So let's do A. Okay. Remember, this is recorded at fair value, right? So transaction cost also you have to add because it's through fair value. Through other comprehensive income, you have to add the transaction cost with the fair value. That is forty plus one, so forty-one. Okay. So you debit the asset, financial asset, forty-one. Because you are buying it and you are buying it for cash, credit forty one. Okay, now there is a remeasurement from two sixty, right? Revalued to sixty. So from forty one, it went to sixty. Fair value nineteen. Okay. So this 19 again you are debiting financial asset by 19 and where are you crediting other comprehensive income OCI 19 next you are selling it for 70 okay but before selling the asset is remeasured to fair value to 70 remember before selling so from 60 to 70 it's 10 okay again you are debiting financial asset by 10 and you are crediting other comprehensive income by 10 now you have to derecognize the asset derecognize so derecognize means you are debiting cash you are receiving cash and you are crediting the financial asset how much you are crediting you are selling it for 70 and you're crediting 70 okay and remember when you're selling it off okay it is not reclassified to profit and loss okay not reclassified because this is equity investments through OCI it is never reclassified to profit and loss when you're selling the financial asset or derecognizing so not reclassified Coming to part B, if it was through profit and loss, 
okay if it was through profit and loss transaction costs are expensed in profit and loss they are not deducted sorry they are not added with the fair value so asset would be debit financial asset at 40 only not 41 you do not add that one and you credit cash this will be same only the amount will be different okay and you debit profit and loss y1 you need to debit that 1 million and you need to credit cash 1 million okay then you are then it went from 40 to 60 fair value so you debit financial asset again 20 and you credit profit and loss this time because everything goes through profit and loss 20 earlier it was how the comprehensive income then when you are selling it okay you are debiting cash 70 you are crediting the financial asset how much 60 because the carrying amount is 60 fair value is 60 and then the profit okay it's a profit you are selling for more than the carrying amount which is 10 the difference so this is the only change when you are taking it through fair value through profit and loss okay now let us go through derivatives derivatives okay so derivative is a financial instrument which has the following characteristics number one the value of this that means the value of the derivative changes in response to change in some other variable for example that variable could be interest rate security prices commodity price exchange rate credit rating right you can say for all these variables underlying so if the value of the underlying changes so does the value of the derivative right you understanding that is the meaning of derivative b it requires little or no initial net investment related to other types of contracts that have a similar response to changes in market conditions so if this if it has this characteristics that financial instrument is a derivative it is different compared to your financial asset financial liability investment in debt instruments or equity instruments derivatives a little different okay that's why it is separate it is settled at a future date derivatives are always something to be settled at a future date okay so these are the three characteristics a derivative has now a contract let's say a contract to buy or sell a non-financial item like contract to buy inventory or plant and machinery is only a derivative if number one it can be settled net in cash or using another financial asset see even cash is a financial asset so if you're using cash to settle it is derivative and the contract was not entered to use those items to meet the entity's operating requirements okay third now ifrs 9 says you have to you have to remember this okay because sbr in your SBR exam, they can ask questions from this derivative part or embedded derivative, which is going to be the next topic. Okay, so be so be. Uh, what do I say? More focused on this area. Okay, derivative had come. It it came in the exam before, right? So it could come derivatives or embedded derivatives. So IFRS 9 says a contract to buy or sell a non-financial item is considered to be settled net in cash when these things are there the terms of the contract permits either party to settle the contract in net or the entity has a practice of setting it in net those contracts third for similar contract okay they have a practice of taking delivery of that item and then quickly selling it in order to benefit from the fair value changes so you buy it you buy the item through a contract sell it shortly and get the benefit of the family changes 
Fourth, the non-financial item is readily convertible to cash. So in these four conditions, okay, you can settle it net in cash. Okay. Now, if a contract is not a derivative, it is simply an executory contract. Executory contracts are not recognized anywhere. You need to understand this. It is outside the scope of IFRS 9. Okay. Such contracts are not normally accounted for until the sale or the purchase date. Understand this. Now, conceptual framework defines an executory contract as what? As a contract that is equally underperformed. That means it has not been performed by both the parties. How? None of the parties fulfill their obligation. An example would be you have a contract to pay your employee 10 for every hour. But let's say employee did not work that hours. Okay, did not work any hours in fact. So you do not have an obligation to pay the employee. So neither the employee is fulfilling their obligation nor the entity. So it's underperformed. So this is an example of an executory contract. Executory contracts are not recognized in financial statements unless it is an honorious contract. Honorious contracts are recognized according to IS 37. You recognize the provision for it. Now, these are the common derivatives and these are the derivatives which you have went through in your financial management or in advanced financial management. Okay, in de detail. They are forward. Forward contracts are a contract to buy or sell okay a definite amount of a specific underlying asset at a specified price at a specified future date future contract are similar to forward the only difference is it comes in a standard quantity okay it comes at a standard quantity and traded on a financial exchange whereas forward they are counted they are tailor-made they are not standard and they are not traded on foreign exchange then we have swap swap is something which you are exchanging you are swapping between the two parties okay this could be done over a specified period of time at some specified interval okay for example there is an interest rate swap that means one party wants to pay at fix the other party wants to pay at floating they are swapping with each other okay and the interest payment are calculated by reference to some notional principal amount then we have options okay this gives the holder the right but not the obligation to sell see it gives the right not the obligation to buy or sell an underlying asset on or before the specified future date measurement of derivatives all derivatives are measured at fair value on initial recognition so that means transaction costs are expensed to profit and loss and at reporting date they are remeasured to fair value so any moment in fair value are, are recognized in profit and loss now let us do question before we move on to embedded derivatives accounting for derivatives okay so in this question you have been given three uh, okay it is in test understanding seven i'm sorry so accounting for derivative okay entity a has a reporting date of 30th september it enters into an option option to purchase 10000 shares okay price was 10 now the purchase price of each option is one dollar okay so this is how the double entry will be like okay you have got an option okay with cash okay obviously you have bought that option with cash so you debit option and you credit cash how much 10,000 into 1 because this is the purchase price of the option you are getting 10,000 shares worth of $1 so option is 10,000 and you have paid cash to get that option 10,000 okay now by 30th September fair value increased to 1.3 so now because the fair value increased only the incremental amount you will write in the option okay earlier fair value was one dollar now it's 1.3 so the difference which is 0 0.3 okay so 0 0.3 into 10,000 will be 3,000 you debit it into option because option value will go up and it's a gain or a loss it's a gain why because remember the nature derivative this is a financial asset 
it's in a form of a derivative but it's a financial asset so when the value fair value of the financial asset goes up it's a gain so that's why this 3000 it's credited where in profit and loss now on 1st of november option is exercised okay here the fair value increases to 1.5 and the share price on that same date is 11.5 okay so exercise options are exercised on that date and also it is classified as fair value through profit and loss okay so now let us go through the double entry you need to debit invest in investment in shares at fair value it's always okay it's an investment it's an asset so it's debited how much 11.5 into 10000 workings are done here for you so this is how much you recognize your financial asset 115000 then you credit cash already you bought your option for this okay this was already calculated 10000 into 10 the purchase price of the option okay sorry it is 10000 shares for 10 sorry 10 per share so this much of cash you have paid option option you can see you can go back and see 10000 was debited then later you debited 3000 so together if you add both is 13000 credit why why are you crediting it because you need to close down the option once you are exercising the option you de-recognize option there is no longer any option then it becomes a financial asset that's why you're debiting financial asset and you're crediting the option earlier option was debited now you credit and close down the option when you exercise option options are closed so you credit then this is the balancing figure okay it's a balancing figure you can see that there is a shortage on the credit side that means it's a profit which is a gain on option okay so with this understanding we are going to do test understanding 17 also it is similar derivative is not something very difficult okay provided you know how to go about so there are three situation that is given to you first options are sold for 15 second share price is 8 option is unexercised in the third option is exercised and share price is 25 okay so he bought 100 options for 5 and share price was 10 now with this understanding okay see first go in the order first what did you get option so you need to debit option and you need to credit cash so debit because it's the derivative option is a derivative which you have bought you understanding so your debit derivative you can say it's a financial asset only it's the same thing how much 100 options into 5 5 per option so 100 into 5 which is 500 and you credit where cash because you need to pay cash to get that option which is also 500 now we are coming to a okay when it is sold see when you are selling something you are selling it for share price is 8 okay but you need to look at the sorry i'm sorry i went to the b it's a 15 so how many options are there 100 into 15 so this is the amount that you have sold it for 1500 how are you going to write the double entry you debit cash because you are going to receive see when you are selling it you are going to receive the cash so debit cash 1500 and you need to credit your asset because you have to de-recognize your asset now because you are selling it off which is how much already you have debited here 500 this only you are crediting here and the balance so if you see you are getting more cash than the amount of the asset so it's a profit right credit pnl whenever pnl account is credit it's a profit the difference 1500 minus 500 minus 500 so it's 1000 okay always balance and see whether debit side is equal to credit side or not so debit is 1500 and if you add the credit 500 and 1000 it's 1500 it should be always like that 
now we are moving on to b where it is unexercised and share price is 8 okay so when it is unexercised you're letting the option lapse okay what's happening you have to derecognize option is to be derecognized and the loss is taken to it's a loss you are not exercising the option so the loss is you are taking to pnl okay so your debit profit it's a loss how much the amount the option the amount of the option go back and see this one option is 500 right this you need to credit now because you are derecognizing it you understanding the option you are derecognizing because you are not exercising it so you credit the option of financial asset 500 the loss is debited now see see you are exercising the option and share price is 25 so because you are exercising the option what happens option is derecognized okay but entity records the cash that is paid upon exercise and investment in shares is recognized at fair value okay and immediate profit is recognized so what do you do you instead record a financial asset debit asset how much 100 option was there into the price what is it 25 is the share price now you are going to receive this When you exercise the option only, you are going to receive this, right? So it's debit 2500. Then you are going to credit cash. Once you exercise the option, you are going to receive, you are going to this one. Record the cash that is paid upon exercise. When you are exercising, you are paying the cash. So you need to credit how much? 100 options into 10. It is the option of the price price option this one 10 per share right to buy a share at this which is thousand then we have credit asset but the option when you're crediting asset this is the option that you're crediting you have to de-recognize how much you recognized it at 500 so you credit 500 the full amount and finally there's a gain the balancing figure which is thousand right so you see it isn't that difficult now let us go through embedded derivatives so now we are moved forward to embedded derivatives okay embedded derivative is a component of a hybrid co contract that includes a non-derivative host with the effect that some of the cash flows of the combined instrument vary in a way very similar to stand alone derivative in short in other words embedded derivative means it has two contract in one one contract okay it is partially derivative and partially non-derivative so how do you account for it that is the meaning of embedded derivative okay accounting treatment for it is you need to memorize this okay because embedded derivative has been tested for sbr i think three to four times okay so you need to be very careful you need to memorize this accounting treatment for embedded derivative specifically with regards to the accounting treatment of embedded embedded derivative if the host contract see host contract is a major contract inside that there might be another contract okay we'll see we'll do a question if the host contract is within the scope of frs9 then the entire contract must be classified and measured in according to that standard that means according to frs9 but if the host contract is not within the scope of frs9 then it's not a financial asset or a financial liability then embedded embedded derivative can be separated out and measured at value through profit and loss okay you can separate it out only when these things are there see this area speci uh, specifically this slide has been tested in your example book. you can go and see your past paper in sbr 
this has been tested it has been asked right like what are the occasions or what conditions are there for you to separate the embedded embedded derivative for the host contract so you need to remember these points number one the economic characteristics and the risks of the embedded derivative are not closely related to the host contract so if the risks and the characteristics are different it's better to separate the two out second the separate instrument with the same terms as the embedded derivative would meet the definition of a derivative third the entire instrument is not measured at fair value with changes in fair value recognizing profit and loss then you need to separate now see because it's very complex right splitting out and all so what does ifrs 9 says regard for embedded derivative ifrs 9 gives okay it permits uh, for a hybrid contract hybrid contract means it has features of two things it has a features of derivative and a non derivative in that one single contract okay where the host element is outside the scope of ifrs 9 that means that host element is not a financial asset or a financial liability then measure the entire contract at fair value through profit and loss entire contract rather than splitting it out because it's difficult right but remember you have to know the reasons uh, or the conditions in which you can split you have to know the conditions they might ask you second and mostly mostly in this area embedded derivative what i have seen they ask a discussion question like you have to write what are the accounting treatments more than the numbers more than the calculation i have not seen a question where calculation has been asked on on this area next for vast majority of embedded derivatives the whole contract will simply be measured at fair value through profit and loss okay now an investor this is an example a very good example an investment in a convertible bond first tell me a convertible bond bond is a financial asset right so it falls within the scope of ifrs 9 okay the c an entity as an investment in a convertible bond which can be converted into a fixed number of equity shares at future so you see there are two things in the in the one contract one it's a convertible bond second you can convert it into equity shares so if you see the bond okay the bond is a non-derivative host contract it's the host main thing is the bond okay what so that main thing is known as host, host contract only right in short how do you understand what is host contract it is the bond okay because without that bond you cannot convert into shares you need that bond so that bond is known as host contract okay in this case it is the bond which is the host contract okay so see the bond is a non derivative is it a derivative no bond is non derivative it's a financial asset so it's a non derivative host contract but the option to convert to share see there is an option also in that whenever in a contract there is a in a financial asset or a financial liability contract you have to see whether there's a forward there's an option there's a swap there's a future attached to it or not if it is attached then it's a embedded derivative you understanding you have a non-derivative in this case it's a bond and you have a derivative component also which is option to convert to shares so bond is a financial asset that means it falls within the scope of ifrs 9 that means you have to use the ifrs 9 rule to the entire contract now the bond would fail the contractual cash flow characteristics why what is contractual cash flow characteristics for this you need to go back to my investment in debt in instruments right it says that if you are having an asset and you are selling it or you are keeping the asset until the redemption okay what are the uh, measurement you have to use how do you measure it varies contractual cash flow characteristics means your cash amount that you are receiving should only be interest and the principal amount but in this case because you are converting it into shares it is just not purely your interest and principal amount that's why it fails the contractual cash flow characteristic test 
the bond so therefore the entire contract is measured at fair value through profit and loss for this you need to go back to the investment in debt in instruments the three methods amortized cost fair value through other comprehensive income fair value through profit and loss and when in which condition do you use this so when the asset fails the contractual cash flow characteristics it is fair value through profit and loss so the entire contract will be measured at fair value through profit and loss now you understand hedge accounting what is hedge accounting so hedge accounting is the last part of ifrs 9 that we are going to go through but to understand hedge accounting okay you need to understand this example very well this is a good example to understand hedge accounting see hedging means taking any action that minimizes your risk it could be any risk your currency risk your interest rate risk or let's say you want to buy a commodity you are fixing a price today so that due to exchange rate changes or interest rate changes the price is fixed you are hedging yourself you are not entirely eliminating the risk but somewhat you are reducing the risk that is the meaning of the, that is the meaning of hedge right the meaning of the hedge is this so we have a accounting for that also which is known as hedge accounting okay and this hedge accounting is for financial instruments because financial instrument is very risky so you need to hedge for it if you are my afm students if you have watched my afm you know what is you know hedging very well it's very easy for you to understand this is nothing for you but if you have not at least through your financial management you know what hedge is right you are hedging currency risk and interest rate risk by using what derivatives you use options forward future swap and so many other things it's the same thing here the way how you account for it is what we are going to study in sbr right not not the whole hedging process no 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 okay but for to go to hedge accounting you need to understand this derivative so let's say an entity has inventories of gold okay and the cost is 8 million whose value has increased to 10 so entity is worried that the fair value of this inventory might fall so what do they do they enter into a future contract to sell the inventory for 10 million okay what can you see let's say by the reporting date the fair value of the inventory had fallen by 1 million so from 10 to 1 it fell down to 9 but inventory fell down but the fair value of the derivative increased by 1 million this is how derivative work when your actual commodity that is there in the question the fair value falls down there is always an opposite reaction in the derivative that will increase that's how you hedge the risk it needs to be offset increase in something needs to be decrease in something okay and it is exactly the same amount you will see okay so the fair value of the inventory had fallen by 1 but fair value of the derivative increased by 1 so you see there's a gain on the derivative according to ifrs 9 so how do you recognize this gain you debit derivative 1 million and you credit pnl now according to is2 why is2 gold is is2 no it's inventory inventories are dealt according to is2 that 1 million decline will not cause any issue okay why because inventories are measured at lower of cost and nrv that is net realizable value net realizable value will be 9 because 10 minus 1 and cost is 8 because initially it was 8 so you will recognize it at 8 anyways it will not have any impact so you see in your inventory it is not having any impact but in the derivative you see there's a profit so this is creating a volatility it is showing a profit which actually it is not because inventory is not affected so this can affect your eps earnings per share you see and it is it could also be a reason to get concerned for whom the dividend receipts because this also will be volatile then based on earnings per share even though some investors are risk seeking 
but most of them prefer steady and predictable returns so you see derivative is cre creating a volatility so that's why entity choose hedge accounting so this volatility will be eliminated now we are going to go in depth to understand what is hedge accounting so hedge accounting okay you don't need to memorize the definitions and anything but you need to know from hedge accounting some key areas that you need to memorize and as we go along i will specify on that area which you need to go through more okay but hedge accounting means you are managing risk by designating one or more hedging instruments so that their change in fair value that means the hedging instruments change in fair value is offset by a change in the fair value or the cash flow of the hedged item okay what is an hedged item you need to know this definition what is a hedging instrument what is a hedged item hedged item could be any asset or liability okay that exposes the entity to to a risk of changes in the fair value or cash flow see risk could be due to two things either the fair value changes or the cash flow could change that's why we are going to go through two types of hedging fair value hedge and cash flow hedge you need to know these two things okay but before the two things commonly we should know what is hedge accounting okay just now we are going through the definition hedge item hedging instrument and all those things before we move on in detail to cash flow hedge and fair value hedge because this two changes either your future cash flow might change that's a risk or the fair value might go up and down that's a change risk so two types of risk we are dealing here okay now there are three types of hedged item number one a financial asset sorry a recognized asset or a liability second it is not recognized but it's a commitment let's say a binding agreement to exchange some goods or services at some price in the future for that also you can hedge third a highly probable focused transaction probability is very high but it is uncommitted okay an uncommitted but anticipated future transaction so this three could be a hedged item in your exam you have to see which one is it out of this three but if it could be any of this three but the way you deal with it is same for all this three okay now what is a hedging instrument hedging instrument is a designated derivative or it could be a non-derivative financial asset or a liability either it could be derivative either it could be a non-derivative financial asset or a liability okay whose fair value could change whose fair value or cash flow offsets the change in the fair value or the cash flow changes in the hedged item you see they work opposite see please understand hedging instrument and hedged item works in opposite direction if you are having a gain in the hedging instrument you are going to have a loss in the hedged item that's how the risks are, risks are offset imagine if you are having risk in the both if you are losing in both the sides then there's no use of hedge accounting right the reason why we are hedging is what to minimize the risk so how do you minimize the risk by offsetting the gain on one side with the loss on the other side two types of hedge accounting fair, fair value and cash flow hedge fair value hedges first we are going to cover fair value hedge and then we are going to move towards cash flow hedge we are going to do questions for both of this and in your sbr these are the two main things that you need to focus on for your from your point of exams sbr exam one is fair value hedge how to account for it one is cash flow hedge how to account for it and by reading the case study in your exam you need to be able to identify correctly whether it's a fair value hedge or a cash flow hedge that is needed they might not say sometimes most of the time they don't say okay so fair value hedge is easy changes in the fair value cash flow changes in the cash flow briefly right it could be anything changes in the fair value of the recognized asset or an unrecognized firm commitment right and this changes are recorded where normally goes through profit and loss but it could be recognized in other comprehensive income only for equity investments equity investments measured at fair value through other comprehensive income for this it is recorded in other comprehensive income okay coming to cash flow hedge this also could be due to
changes in the cash flow. Now, there are some criteria. This criteria also you need to memorize. You need to know. This has been asked in the exam before. Criteria for hedge accounting. Three conditions needs to be there. Okay. If it's there, then only you can apply hedge accounting. Otherwise, it's not applicable. Number one. Hedging relationship consists only of eligible hedging instruments and hedge items. That means hedging instruments should go with hedge items. It, they should be eligible. Second. At the start, there should be a formal documentation that says that this is the hedge item and this is the hedging instrument. Third, hedging relationship meets all the effectiveness requirement. That means they are very effective with each other. So these are the three conditions. You need to memorize it if they ask you. If you are lucky, they might ask you straightforward questions like this and you just need to write these three points. Criteria for hedge accounting. Now, moving on to accounting treatment of a fair value hedge. If it's a fair value at the reporting date, you are remeasured to fair value. Hedging instrument are remeasured to fair value. And the hedged item, you just change. The carrying amount of the hedged item, you adjust with the change in fair value. Now, please see the line, uh, read this line very carefully. The gain or loss on the hedging instrument and then the loss of the gain on the hedged item. You see, if you are having a gain, in the hedging instrument, you are going to have a loss on hedged item. If you're having a loss in the hedging instrument, you are going to have a gain in the hedged item. It's the opposite. It's always opposite. It's not gain, gain or loss, loss. It's gain on the one side and loss on the other side or loss on one side and gain on the other side. That's how it works. Okay. So this is recorded like this. Most of the time in profit and loss because fair value hedge. But under one condition, it goes through other comprehensive income. I told you earlier. That is when equity instruments are measured at fair value through other components of income. That time it is at other components of income. Now, first let us do questions on fair value hedge before we move on to cash flow hedge. So, this example is picked from the previous one where we have been mentioning the inventories of gold, price was 8, and then fair value increased to 10. Sorry whose value had increased to 10 and they had a fear that value will go down by 1, right, to 9. So we are doing the same question, okay, and we are going to change this to hedge accounting. How are we going to use hedge accounting to solve the issue? Remember in the previous one, derivative was debited and it was a gain on the derivative of 1 million with no impact in inventory. So there was a volatility in the profit and loss. Now we are going to eliminate it. Okay. So this was designated as a fair value hedge. That same scenario. Please recall it. I'm not going to go through it again and explain the same scenario. Okay. Because it's going to take a lot of time. So the entity believe that all effectiveness criteria has been met. Okay. See, how do you understand whether you have to use hedge accounting or not? For simplicity in SBR, good thing is. They will always mention this. Okay. That means you don't have to do any test or do anything. They will say that effectiveness criteria has been met. That means you can use hedge accounting. Okay. Now, so this is a fair value hedge. Please understand. This was the normal situation. Right. We debited derivative and credited 1 million. Now we are going to change this by using hedge accounting. How? We are going to remove this gain. So we are going to debit 1 million. Credit debit. There is no gain on loss. It gets cancelled off. And you are going to credit inventory 1 million. So from inventory, we are going to reduce that 1 million. See what's happening here. By applying hedge accounting, the profit impact of remeasuring the derivative to fair value has been offset by the moment in the fair value of the inventory. Now there is no more gain. It gets cancelled off. Eliminated. So that means the volatility in the profit is reduced now. Impact is reduced. Okay. But the change is taking place where? In the inventory. Inventory was supposed to be measured at lower of net realizable value and cost. 8 or 9. But you see, it is now measured at 7. Earlier it was at 8, right? So from 8, reduce 1. Because inventory was credit. So 7. So it's neither at cost nor at NRV, but even lower than that. So what's happening when you're using hedge accounting? 
you are changing the normal accounting treatment of inventory this has been changed when you are using hedge accounting rules you can do that okay so now let us do two more questions on fair value hedge test to understanding 18 and 19 test your understanding 18 this is a question on fair value hedge okay so this is an equity investments through fair value okay fair value was 900000 now by the reporting date fair value of equity instrument had fallen to 800000 and fair value of the future contract has risen to 900000 see one fell down one increased hedged item and hedging instrument you need to understand this okay so now the middle part is regarding all the conditions saying that effectiveness criteria has been met everything was proper correctly documented right and hedging instrument and hedged item has been identified things like that now so with this understanding what would be the double uh, accounting treatment that means double entry see in this case profit and loss will go through oci because it has been designated as oci equity investment so not profit and loss okay now there was an increase in the fair value of derivative you see derivative is the future contract it increased by 90000 and fall in the value of the equity interest that is hedged item by 100000 from 900 to 800 so how do you rec uh, record this for increased derivative increased so you debit derivative how much 90000 and you credit what the hedged item the equity investment how much 100000 because from 900 to 800 the difference now here you need to debit OCI okay it's again 90,000 but here you need to credit OCI again sorry debit OCI again because it's a loss when equity investment fell by 100,000 so what can you see you can see OCI this is uh, credit okay and this is sorry this is credit this is debit debit is more right 190 the difference so there's a difference of 10,000 10,000 loss if you take the difference 190 there's a loss right small loss of 10,000 in OCI the net result this is the net result of OCI this is how you need to deal with fair value hedge now let us do test to understanding 19 test your understanding 19 okay unlike the previous one where it was a fixed as where it was the asset or a liability recognized asset or a liability this is a firm commitment even this could be used as an a hedged item okay so in a b are not using hedge accounting b we are using the hedge accounting okay so here they have made a firm commitment to buy some machinery okay and here they have a risk of exchange rate fluctuation on 1st of October, they enter into a future contract to buy for 1 million. And 31st December, it would cost them 1.1 million. Fair value of the future increased to 95,000. There was no future contract before, now it increased to 95,000. So now, if we don't use the hedge accounting, okay, how should we account for it? Please understand the nature of the question okay if hedge accounting is not used understand that future contract okay in this case future contract is a derivative okay because I told you option future forward swap these are derivatives so because it's a derivative derivative is a, how, how are derivatives measured we went through this earlier fair value they are fair value through 
profit and loss so derivatives are measured at fair value through profit and loss now if you see the fair value of the future contract it was from nil zero you can say zero to 95000 it increased to 95000 okay so you can see that there's a rise so because there's a rise how are you going to recognize this debit derivative in this case derivative is the asset 95000 okay and this gain will be credited in profit and loss credit pnl 95000 okay now we are coming to b with the hedge accounting you see okay so the same thing we are going to recognize okay this we can easily do okay we just copy paste this debit derivative and credit pnl 95000 this will be same the older thing is in the hedge accounting okay you need to debit because there will be a loss in the pnl and there will be credit firm commitment the commitment is a hedged item here so you can credit that okay we need to find the value for it see before it was 1 million now it increased to this much it's more cost right that means you can say the fair value fell down by 100,000 the difference between this 1.1 million and 1 million is 100 100,000 right so there's a 100,000 fall in the fair value of the commitment don't say it increased no that's not how you look 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 at the bigger picture okay earlier purchasing would cost them 1 million now it's 1.1 million it's more so therefore you can say when the cost is more the fair value fell down okay so 100,000 so you record 100,000 now you see here debit is 100 and credit is 50 you have a gain of 95,000 and a loss of 100,000 the net loss is 5,000 so small loss still will be there okay but still even if you have a net loss of 5000 it is still better than leaving it unhedged you see earlier the profit it shows a profit of 95000 it's a much bigger picture but now it has been reduced to a net loss of just 5000 so leaving it unhedged is still not safe right hedging is still better than leaving it unhedged because it reduces your volatility accounting treatment of cash flow hedge this is a little difficult compared to fair value hedge you need to uh, keep doing questions to understand the pattern okay it could be a little tricky in the beginning but as you get used to it you will love it okay so cash flow hedge for cash flow hedges now it is changed earlier for fair value it was the hedging hedged uh, item that was remeasured to fair value for cash flow hedge it is the hedging instrument that is remeasured to fair value at the reporting date and gain and loss are recognized in other components of income you see in profit and fair value it was through profit and loss but in gain and uh, in cash flow hedge it is through other components of income however if the gain and the loss of the hedging instrument is more than the gain or the loss on the hedged item then the excess gain and loss goes to profit and loss we'll do a question on this don't worry now accounting treatment if hedged item results in the recognition of a financial asset or a liability then gain and losses are rec then gain and losses are reclassified to profit and loss from other comprehensive income okay and this reclassification is done in the same period during which the hedged focused cash flow affects your profit and loss 
if the hedged item leads to a recognition of a non-financial asset or liability okay you do not you do not reclassify to profit and loss okay instead the gain and loss in equity are adjusted again the carrying amount of the non-financial asset or liability so you change the carrying amount of the non-financial asset or liability with the gain and loss you do not bring from oci to profit and loss that means it does not affect other components of income if the hedged item leads to recognition of non-financial asset or liability now let us do three questions on cash flow hedge test your understanding 20 cash flow hedge okay so you have been given a question okay this is a derivative contract in order to protect his future cash inflow relating to a recognized financial asset okay now loss in respect of future cash flow amounted to 9100 but you have to do a and b right when the hedging instrument fair value was 8500 and 10000 how do you account for it a okay when hedging instruments fair value was 8500 c it is below 9100 right less so the movement on the hedging instrument is less than the movement in the hedged item therefore everything goes to oci normally normal way okay so you debit derivative 8500 the problem only comes when hedging instruments changes more like for part b a is easy so you credit oci other comprehensive income this is cash flow hedge okay b here it's 10000 is more than 9100 so hedging instrument changes more than the hedged item therefore the excess goes to profit and loss what is the excess 900 this 900 will go to profit and loss so here also you debit derivative how much 10,000 you credit OCI 9,100 up to the farewell of the hedged item anything more than that profit and loss which is 900 okay let's do test understanding 21 test understanding 21 blink so here you are required to discuss the accounting treatment of hedge in the year 31st december 2001 b you are having an inventory cell okay so accounting treatment of the inventory cell and the future contract settlement on 31st march 2002 let's first finish with a okay so here on 31st october you have some inventories of gold cost 6.4 and you would want to sell for 7.7 .7. okay now they went into a future contract to sell the good for 7.7 .7. okay now 31st december 2001 the farewell of the gold was 8.6 you see there's a rise from 7.7 .7 to 8.6 whereas the fair value of the future contract fell down by 0 0.9 from that date onwards till 31st march there is no change in the fair value of the gold or the future contract okay so this looks quite easy i think you'll be able to do it right isn't it so this is a cash flow hedge so cash flow hedge will go through oci okay so a you can quickly do a it's a loss you see the future contract fell down by 0 0.9 so it's a loss okay this loss goes through other comprehensive income so debit oci 0 0.9 and you credit derivative 0.9 okay now coming to B when you are actually settling it right the inventory sale and the future contract settlement first we'll go by the inventory sale 
so when you are selling the inventory you are receiving cash so your debit cash how much it is for 8.6 this amount because fair value does not change from this date till 31st March. so it remains at 8.6 next you need to credit revenue you are recognizing a revenue it's a sale which is 8.6 again you need to you are selling an inventory so when you're selling an inventory debit cost of sales credit inventory okay so how much see this is regarding cash and sales okay but your inventory was was for 6.4 this was the cost that you bought it so this is the inventory you have to reduce from your inventory now so debit 6.4 credit 6.4 okay now sale of inventory at fair value okay so now this is regarding this part is for wait this part is for sale of inventory next part will be settling the settlement of the future contract So when you are settling the future contract, okay, you credit a derivative here. Okay, now it will be reversed. You are debiting derivative. How much? 0 0.9. You need to close down your derivative. You had a credit balance, now you debit 0 0.9. And you are settling. So credit cash. You have to pay cash. For the financial instrument right to get it 0 0.9 again now just you have to reclassify the losses that is in equity through profit and loss okay because during that same period fair value has been affected so fair value affected means your profit gets affected right so if the hedged item affects the profit and loss in the same period you have to reclassify to profit and loss right So now the loss is debited to profit and loss and credit to, to OCI 0 0.9 and 0 0.9. Why? See the difference. Eight point six and seven point seven. Okay. during this time if you see here you are selling the good for 7.7 .7. now get the gold now the gold is more the fair value of the gold is 8.6 so it increased so it increased means what your cash flow is suffering right so in this period that change that loss has to has to be reclassified to profit and loss from oci understanding what i'm saying 0 0.9 so you have to remove it from oci and debit in profit and loss because it's affecting your cash flow it's affecting your profit obviously your cash flow will be more now you have to now spend more for the gold 
okay 8.6 but it will affect your profit also so that's why you debit profit and you create it OCA. now the last question for this lecture which is test understanding 22 okay this is a highly probable transaction remember out of the three we told that there are three types of hedged item this is the third one okay this is regarding currency okay some dollar okay so they want to buy an item of plant in one year's time at this okay now they went into a forward rate agreement okay so for this this is the fixed sum okay hundred thousand they have to pay to go for this forward rate agreement okay fair value of the contract at inception was zero and it was designated as a hedging instrument by 31st this went to 90,000 100,000 went to 90,000 it reduced and the fair value of the derivative declined by 10,000 how do you account for this This is a forward rate agreement. In this case, derivative is the forward rate agreement. It was nil before. Now it has been and it declined by 90, uh, sorry, 10,000. Even though derivative declined, but cash flow had increased by 10,000. How? See, earlier it was 100,000. Now it's 90,000. It's cheaper now. So you're saving on cash. So it's a cash flow hedge. Cash flow will increase. Right? It's now 10,000 cheaper to buy the asset. So because it is the cash flow hedge, you need to debit. You need to, it need to go through other comprehensive income. Okay? It's a gain. Sorry, it's a derivative loss. Sorry, sorry. There's a fall in value of derivative. Don't see the hedged item. See the hedging instrument. Derivative went down. So debit OCI, it's a loss of 10,000 and you credit derivative 10,000 fair enough now see what type of asset is it this is item of plant property plant and equipment okay so it's a non-financial item the word is non-financial item. So because it's a non-financial item, you have to adjust the carrying amount of the plant. You do not recognize it in profit and loss or OCI. You adjust. Okay. So this would be the entry when you adjust. Okay. So for the settlement of the derivative, And purchase of asset okay you debit plan because you are buying the asset how much 90,000 from 100 it fell down by 10,000 so 90,000 you are also debiting a liability or let's say derivative How much 10,000 it went down by 10,000 see here you credited derivative so close down the derivative by debiting it settlement of derivative is there will be no derivative balance and you credit cash to buy plan you need cash how much 100,000 cash will be 100,000 only right this nothing is happening to the cash only the fair value changed of the plant now you have to adjust remember what do you do you have to adjust this the carrying amount of the plant with the loss so what is the loss loss is 10,000 so that 10,000 you have to add with the plant
So you debit 10,000 more and you credit this from where? Cash flow, hedge reserve. From here. Now see if you add this okay debit 10,000 and plan 90,000. So if you add 90 and 10 it adds up to 100,000. Okay. And now if you see that was exactly what the hedge was guaranteed for. You see fixed sum of 100,000. I'll highlight it for you. Boom. You see. This is what hedge accounting does. There was a loss of 10,000 you adjusted in the carrying amount of the plan. Right. So this would be the total amount of cash that would be spent 100,000 even your derivative was guaranteed at this position in the beginning. Hedge effectiveness we went through this earlier okay but now we are going to go in depth and you need to memorize this part the hedge effectiveness okay. So hedge accounting can only be used if hedging relationship meets all the effectiveness requirement okay. In all the questions we have done so far it has been met okay and ifrs 9 says that when you are starting okay at the start of the hedging relationship okay and at each reporting date entity must assess whether a hedging relationship meets the hedge effectiveness requirement or not hedge effectiveness requirements are this number one Remember, there are three requirements, okay? And these three requirements you should only answer when the question asks you. Otherwise, it is assumed default position is hedge effectiveness is there. I have not seen any question in SBR where they say hedge, there is hedge ineffectiveness. Everything is hedge effectiveness if a numerical question is asked. If a numerical question is not asked, they might ask you generally what are the hedge effectiveness requirements. Then you can give these three requirements. Memorize the three requirements. But with understanding first there should be an economic relationship between the hedged item and the hedging instrument for example when the price of the share falls by 10 fair value of the future contract should rise by 10 you understand then only there's an economic relationship if the share price falls and there is no effect on the future contract that means there is no relationship so hedge is ineffective you understand second the effect of the credit risk does not dominate the value change that result from the economic relationship. For example, credit risk okay, may lead to erratic fair value movements. It could be either in the hedging instrument or the hedged item. For example, let's say a counterparty of the derivative experiences a decline in credit worthiness. What happens? Fair value of the derivative will suffer because of that, right? Which is the hedging instrument will fall substantially. So, this fall in the farewell of the derivative is unrelated to the changes in the farewell of the item. You see, this shift in the farewell of the derivative is not because of the change in the farewell of the hedged item. It's different. It is because of the, it's a credit risk. So, this movement is unrelated to changes in the farewell of the item. Therefore, this will lead to hedge ineffectiveness. Because it is not related to the farewell of the item, this hedge is ineffectiveness. You understand? They should be they should be related. If it's unrelated, hedge ineffective. Third, hedge ratio. That's what we are going to go through next. Hedge ratio. Hedge ratio is same. That means we are using this. The, sorry, the hedge ratio of the hedging relationship is the same as that resulting from the quantity of the hedged item and the quantity of the hedging instrument is the same. We'll go through in detail what is hedge ratio. Hedge ratio. Okay, let's say an entity owns 120,000 gallons of oil and it enters into one future contract for to sell 40,000 gallons. Okay, so the middle part I'm not reading, it's a fair value hedge. Okay, oil is the hedged item, Con future contract is the hedging instrument. Okay, and it is deemed effective. Okay, so if deemed effective, everything will go through profit and loss because it's a fair value hedge, it will be record recognizing profit or loss. Okay, but if you see 
you are having 120 but future but hedging instrument is 40,000 because of this change it's not same if it would be one future contract to sell 120,000 gallon it makes sense but there's a very huge difference so you can see that this will have an impact on your hedge ratio so the hedge ratio means gain or loss on the item will be much bigger than the loss or gain on the instrument it should not be so that's why you have to adjust this hedge ratio you have to adjust hedge ratio must be adjusted to avoid this imbalance why because if it is so okay it creates a volatility in profit and loss and this goes against hedge accounting odds with the purpose of hedge accounting the meaning of hedge accounting is to reduce or eliminate volatility in profit and loss if it's creating more volatility it is against the rule of hedge accounting so that's why you have to adjust this hedge ratio so this imbalance goes off okay this is how we do that now change it the hedged item should be designated as 40000 gallons of oil with the hedging instrument as one future contract only you are not changing the hedging instrument but hedged item you see it was 120000 gallon change that to 40000 why because you have a contract to sell 40000 so change that hedged item to 40000 so hedge 40000 rather than 120 okay and the other 80000 the balance 80000 40000 is a hedged item correct out of 120 balance 80000 you account it as inventory according to is2 that's it so now let's go through rebalancing rebalancing okay many hedging relationships involves basis risk okay what is basis risk because of this basis risk okay we need to rebalance okay but many hedging relationships involves basis risk okay basis risk means the risk that the gain or loss on the item the hedged item will not be equal to the gain or loss on the instrument see when you are having the gain in the item and a loss in the instrument they are same that's why you can offset but if there's a different okay there's a difference between the risk and gain of the item with the gain and loss of the instrument then it is said to have a basis risk okay the name is called as basis risk and sometimes this risk is significant if it is insignificant you can ignore but if it is significant you cannot ignore then what should you do you have to rebalance your hedging ratio but before coming to that let us go through one example of airline companies how do they hedge okay sometimes they have to hedge their fuel cost right by entering into future contract so let's say they enter into a future contract to buy crude oil okay but the cost of the airplane fuel is not just by the crude oil there are so many other factors okay and at the reporting date you came to know that the fair value of the hedged item hedged item in this case is the fuel okay this has moved considerably more than the fair value of the hedging instrument that is the future contract you see there's a difference both are not moving in the same line they are different so what happens in this case you may need to enter into some additional future contract right so when you enter into additional future contract what happens hedge hedge ratio changed we earlier went through hedge ratio right so hedge ratio needs to change now you have to change it because if you don't change it will not comply with the effectiveness requirement remember to to apply hedge accounting okay there should be the hedging relationship should be effective if it's not effective you cannot apply hedge accounting that was the condition number one that's why you have to adjust your hedging ratio right otherwise you cannot use hedge accounting so if you want to apply hedge accounting you have to rebalance rebalance what the designated quantities of hedged item and the designated quantities of hedging instrument let's see okay 
so now now we are in the last part of hedging accounting that is conditions when you can discontinue hedge accounting okay you can see the hedge accounting if any of the following occur number one the hedging instrument expires or it is exercised or it is sold or terminated number two the hedge no longer miss the hedging criteria maybe the hedging relationship was not effective maybe it was not documented well right you need to go back and check the hedging criteria number three the forecast future transaction that qualified as a hedged item is no longer highly probable so in any of these three condition apply you have to discontinue hedge accounting and remember once you discontinue hedge accounting you have to account for it prospectively prospectively means you have to change from the today and future onwards you don't have to go back and change your uh, past right so entries posted to date are not reversed the discontinued happened from the day when any of this falling occurred and you have to apply it in the future you don't have to go in the past and change next upon discontinuing a hedge cash flow hedge okay the treatment of gain and losses on the hedging instrument depends on the reason for that continuation how you are going to deal with that gain and losses are you going to transfer to profit and loss or you're not going to transfer it depends on the reason for that discontinuation number one if ifrs 9 says okay if the focus transaction is no longer expected to occur gain and loss will be recognized in profit and loss from other components of income immediately if the transaction is expected to occur gain and loss will remain in the equity until the format edged transaction occurs so if the transaction is no no, no longer expected gain and losses will go to profit and loss from other components of income if the transaction is expected to occur it remains in other components of income the gain and loss okay so that's it for ifrs 9 since ifrs 9 is a very lengthy lecture i know that's why i have summarized all the separate parts that we went through and summarize each part in different like under different small small subheadings so that it becomes easier for you to grasp even if you have missed out the whole thing through the summary you can understand the main points okay so let us go first we went through financial liabilities when we started ifrs 9 okay initially you recognize financial liability at fair value but subsequent measurement there is a choice amortized cost of fair value through profit and loss for financial asset a trading commitment to buy a good and sell to buy a good sell good is not recognized until one party has fulfilled its part of contract okay next forward contracts are derivative financial assets and they are recognized on the commitment date option are recognized on the date when you entered into the contract not when you have exercised that is also a derivative financial asset number three equity instrument investments in equity instruments are measured at either fair value through profit and loss or fair value through other components of income it is not measured through amortized cost right equity instrument only this two fair value through other components of income can be used if if not held for trade or irrevocably designated irrevocably designated means you cannot go back to profit and loss once you have elected for it forever it is through other components of income then gain and loss will never be reclassified to profit and loss for equity instruments it is little different and little similar to debt in instrument okay debt in instruments three methods are there you can measure it at amortized cost also amortized cost if if contractual cash flow characteristics test pass what is what does it mean contractual cash flow means it should only include interest and the principal amount for example if you are giving a loan or a bond only the interest and the principal if it includes other than this two then it does not pass the test business model has to hold the debt until maturity okay other components of income if contractual test here also is the same contractual cash flow characteristics test needs to be passed and business model is holding to maturity but selling and selling so please understand this difference if you keep it till maturity and sell it is other comprehensive income if you do not sell it is amortized cost then 
Debt instruments can also be measured at fair value through profit and loss if it's not at amortized or other comprehensive income. And gain and losses, unlike equity instrument, you can classify to reclassify to profit and loss when the asset is disposed. That means when the debt instrument is disposed. Debt instrument measured at either amortized or fair value through other comprehensive income, then you have to recognize a loss allowance. Please understand that is the next topic. Impairment of financial assets. Like any other asset, even your financial asset might be impaired, right? Impairment we went through in IS 36. Okay. So for financial asset, it is based on the credit risk. If the credit risk on the financial asset does not increase significantly from the initial recognition, then your loss allowance must be calculated based on the 12 month expected credit loss. And if the credit risk increases significantly, then the expected, sorry, the loss allowance is equal to lifetime expected credit loss. Please understand this. If risk credit risk does not increase significantly, 12 month expected credit loss. If credit risk increases significantly, lifetime expected credit loss. Okay. Impairment of financial assets. Loss allowance should always be measured at an amount equal to lifetime credit loss for what? For trade receivable and contract asset. If they do not have a significant financing component, you need to memorize this point by the way. Okay. Because a small portion of it might come for your exam, you never know. For lease receivable as well as trade receivable and contract asset with a significant financing component, entity can choose. Entity can choose to measure the loss allowance equal to lifetime expected credit loss. Impairment reversal. Sometimes it reverses. How? Maybe credit risk reduced or so in that case, gain or losses on remeasurement of this loss allowance are recorded in profit and loss. Okay. Now, sixth, sixth topic was derecognition on financial instruments. Financial asset is derecognized if one of the following occur. Number one, either the contractual right expired, the contractual right to receive cash expired, or let's say the option held by the entity lapsed or became worthless. Financial asset has been sold or substantially the risk and reverse has been transferred to the buyer. Financial liability is derecognized when obligation is discharged. For derivatives is number seven, right? On initial recognition, please understand derivative is very easy. Derivatives are measured at fair value on initial recognition, okay? Derivatives means options, forward, future, these are derivatives. Okay, and at reporting date, they are again remeasured to fair value. So any moment in this fair value is recognized in profit and loss. In short, everything goes to profit and loss for in derivatives. Okay, a contract to buy or sell a non-financial item. See, if, if it's a financial item, it's very easy. You know it's IFRS 9 because IFRS 9 means financial instruments. But what if it's a non-financial item that you have a contract to buy or sell? In that case, okay, even that is a derivative, by the way. If you are having a contract, because contract itself is a derivative, if you are having a future to buy or sell a non-financial item, okay, is only a derivative if it has this three condition. Number one, it can be settled net in cash or using another financial asset. Then it's a derivative. And the contract was not entered for the purpose of the receipt or delivery of that item. To meet the entity's operating requirement. If it is this, then See, you entered into a contract to hedge. You go, you buy or sell, okay? You go into the derivative to hedge. That is your purpose. So if you're entering into a contract for the purpose of receipt, it's not a derivative. Okay? Then the third, if the contract is not a derivative, how do you account for it? It is a simply an executory contract. An executory contract is outside the scope of IFRS 9. You have to write it. Embedded, embedded derivatives. Okay. 
this part part 8 be very careful on this one because this has been tested in the exam this has been tested even during my time right embedded derivative i think it came for five marks whether we have to separate from the host contract or not the derivative right if the host contract is within the scope of IFRS 9, the entire contract is classified and measured according to that standard. That means IFRS 9. Okay. If the host contract is not within the scope of IFRS 9, the embedded derivative has to be separated. It needs to be separated out and measured at fair value through profit or loss. If these things are there, economic risks and characteristics of the embedded derivative are not in line with host contract they are separate that's why you have to separate right if they are similar why would you have to separate thing like that thing logically second a separate instrument with the same terms of embedded derivative would meet the definition of a derivative and the entire instrument is not measured at fair value with the changes in fair value recognizing profit and loss then you need to separate So IFRS 9 permits a hybrid contract. Hybrid means it has two. Okay. Where the host element is outside the scope of IFRS 9. Okay. IFRS 9 says it to be measured at fair value through profit and loss in its entirety. That means entirely measured at fair value through profit and loss. Okay. Next, vast majority of embedded derivatives. Okay. That means the whole contract will simply be measured at fair value through profit and loss. So they so basically this question if they ask in the exam they normally ask this as a discussion question rather than you to solve some numbers or calculate it does not come in numerics so it's easy if you memorize these points okay if you understand if you memorize these points with an understanding it's even better okay condition where you need to separate the host contract from the embedded is this three condition okay that means embedded derivative and the whole contract. Their risks are different. Their characteristics are different. They are not measured uh, at fair value. Then you separate. Okay. Hedge accounting. That one was the last one. So we went through fair value hedge, cash flow hedge, criteria for hedge accounting, all your hedging effectiveness, hedge ratio and all those things and discontinuing hedge accounting okay so that's it for ifrs 9 and i know it's a very lengthy lecture but what to do i mean this is a very important and a very challenging topic on its own and i've done lots of questions now is your job to go to your revision kid and do all the question from ifrs 9 right you need to touch all the areas separately whether it's embedded derivative whether it is financial uh, asset financial liability equity instrument debt instrument financial asset impairment everything needs to be touched okay so thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't subscribed yet right so see you in the next lecture again another interesting lecture which is ifrs